the primary one going through what's known as hatch and pre uh, vestibule pressurization. We open in a small valve on the hatch on the station side to flow atmosphere from station into that small space between uh, the dragon hatch and the station hatch. And we are going to stick with you uh, all the way through docking, through hatch opening, until we get to that welcome. Um, so we're just a little over a minute coming up to this mid-course burn. I'm going to stop talking for a moment. I want to toss it over uh, to Tricia and Andy for a quick check in at Hawthorne as we're getting good views of Dragon and we're going to get better ones coming up real soon. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot to unpack here, Tricia. Uh, as Dan mentioned, this is uh, a live view if you are just joining us of the Ax uh, Axiom 1 mission. Uh, so Dragon is about two kilometers away from the International Space Station, making its way to waypoint zero, which is going to be uh, 400 meters away. And then um, there are more milestones that it'll uh, need to go through um, before it docks in about an hour. So, um, you know, we are watching Dragon, uh, but things will definitely begin to pick up pace here uh, as we get uh, closer and closer to the International Space Station. Absolutely. What an exciting time for uh, the four-person Axiom crew who are on their way to the ISS right now. Um, you know, for three of them, it's their first time experiencing something like this. Uh, they've, uh, all four crew members have certainly been very busy leading up to the launch and up to this moment with, you know, hours and hours, I believe 700 to 1,000 hours of training that they had to go through uh, in order to, you know, be prepared for this type of experience, for working on the ISS and, uh, you know, for uh, achieving the objectives that they're going to be doing over the next eight days. Yeah, and if you um, have been uh, following this mission uh, since uh, launch yesterday morning, uh, we did have an on-orbit live event about three hours ago. And, uh, you know, to, to quote Larry Connor, uh, he had said that uh, he tried eating a muffin and uh, he, uh, things did not go as planned. So uh, despite the 700 to 1,000 hours of training, I think getting used to uh, living and, and operating in a microgravity environment uh, can be tricky, but, uh, you know, the, the team has, a ton of science uh, ahead of them in the next um, 10 days or, or nine days now. Um, uh, um, so uh, right now, you know, they're, they're getting acclimated. They woke up uh, about four hours ago. And so um, you, we saw uh, shots inside of Dragon. Um, they have their suits on. We heard that uh, we had four good leak checks. And so um, they're seated, they're strapped in. And um, in about an hour, they're going to be docking and um, uh, you know, hopefully uh, seeing the rest of the crew uh, shortly. Absolutely. And, you know, they, like you mentioned, they have a jam-packed schedule for the next uh, eight to nine days that they're going to be on orbit. The uh, four-person crew are going to be responsible for um, just about 25 experiments and over 100 hours of crew time dedicated to research, as well as outreach activities uh, that, you know, they'll be addressing several uh, science, technology, and um, art-based uh, outreach events. So, you know, they have a uh, busy schedule coming up ahead. And, you know, as you mentioned on the On Orbit Live event, we saw a little bit about how they were acclimating to the zero-G life. Uh, the three who have never flown before, they were still getting the hang of how to uh, orient themselves in a microgravity environment. And it's, it's certainly harder than it looks. Um, I was able to actually personally, a few weeks ago, be a part of a zero-G flight um, along with several of my colleagues from Axiom Space, where we were testing out some hardware for the station, and it was uh, it was pretty difficult not to just <laughs> you know go flying down the the cabin of the airplane um, when we were in those microgravity um, moments. So, you know, pretty tough. Yeah, it really just is a testament to um, you know all of the training that the crew 
uh, had to uh, go through to be ready for this mission. Uh, but you know, as Dan was setting up, uh, we were anticipating the mid-course uh, burn, which is essentially a, a, a minor correction burn uh, if Dragon needs to sort of uh, you know make minor adjustments uh, to align itself and, and ensure that it's on the right course to waypoint zero. That burn has completed, and it completed successfully, no issues. Uh, so with that, we're going to send it back over to Dan at uh, JSC in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy and Tricia. So yeah, as Andy just said, we had a good mid-course maneuver. We heard that they have converged on waypoint zero, which is going to be our stop point. And this appears to be a view from Dragon closing in on the space station. They're just a little over a kilometer away and continuing to close in. They've slowed down to just about 1.7 meters per second, uh, but we should be coming up on waypoint zero, moving them just 400 meters below the station in about 16 minutes. And we're getting a look over the shoulders of uh, the commander and pilot seats. And in that center screen, you're able to see uh, their expected flight path. So you can see it's swinging up. Uh, the station is at the top of that screen uh, in the uh, crosshair, and they're going to stop just 400 meters directly below, and then they're going to execute a maneuver to fly up and over top the station, getting onto their docking axis, looking at the space-facing port on Harmony before they begin the final approach. And now we'll go side by side, and we should be getting a sunrise in about a minute or so, so we'll see things start to light up. You can already see uh, the station itself starting to enter into an orbital dawn as both of these spacecraft right now are flying just over the southern part of the Pacific Ocean, about to begin a pass over South America. So with that successful mid-course burn, we're, we're essentially done with all the major uh, burns during this approach. We're just going to be now using uh, some of the Draco thrusters for these uh, translational moves through the different waypoints. Uh, we've got three waypoints. We're going to go through waypoint zero, waypoint one, and waypoint two. Zero just 400 meters below the station. Waypoint one, 220 meters directly above the docking port on the space facing side. And then waypoint two, just 20 meters away from docking. So they're going to continue to close in. We're essentially using all of the service section Draco thrusters at this point. And so that was the Capcom here in Houston. Capcom here in Houston, Scott Segati giving the call up to the crew, again, using what's called the big loop. So that's just all of our different communication loops, space to grounds to station and dragon to grounds to dragon all tied together, uh, allowing the team here in Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the crew members on board station and dragon all to talk with each other. And Scott was radioing up essentially the procedure that NASA astronaut Rajachari, who's doing the approach monitoring, is able to jump into. Um, and he is standing by in the station's cupola, and he is able to monitor getting real-time data fed through that bidirectional link from Dragon to the space station. He's also able to send commands to the vehicle. So in addition to uh, having that human oversight inside Dragon and on the ground in Hawthorne, you've got the station crew in the loop as well. But everything has proceeded very smoothly so far today with the automated rendezvous. And you heard we're, we're less than a kilometer away, so Dragon at this point inside the approach ellipsoid. It's going to continue to approach. We've got about 450 meters to go. We should get to waypoint zero in just a hair under 13 minutes from now. And at this point, the teams are going to start doing their go-no-goes for each of the different waypoints. So uh, again, we can get to these waypoints and we can pause. if we need to either 
stop and make sure that uh, the relative navigation is functioning, if we run into any issues with thrusters, any issues on station, um, or if everything continues to be green, we just continue right past the points and we'll go from zero to waypoint one pretty quickly. And so just about 12 minutes away from that next stop, uh, we might occasionally see some thruster firings uh, on board Dragon when we get the views from the space station. Uh, at this point, we're using what's known as And that was Rajachari radioing down that the attitude of Dragon is as we expect it. Again, Dragon controlling its attitude with a number of different sensors. One of the primary ones, just an inertial measurement unit, which uses accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, to understand Dragon's relative position. Uh, also using, for this final approach, Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground, com check. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to ground, loud and clear. Hey Larry, on Dragon to ground, wanted to let you know that we are not getting any response on the big loop. Uh, Jake, uh, Understood, and uh, we'll investigate at our end. SpaceX Endeavor dragging the ground out here. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. We had you three by three there. Okay, I read a little while ago. A comp check, both on the big loop. I guess you didn't hear me. Okay, copy all. We've got you on Dragon to ground recommend another comm check on the big loop. Alright, Captain, that didn't work. This action never on Dragon, uh, sorry, on the big loop, out of here. Hey Mike, we had you 3x3 three three there. Not sure if you did anything differently, but that seemed to work. I don't think I did, but I'm glad it's working now. Okay, so a couple of quick updates. The crew was given the go to proceed through waypoint zero, on through waypoint one, and all the way through waypoint two. So we're going to see Dragon step through these different waypoints pretty quickly. So we're just under 200 meters away from waypoint zero, and we're approaching station from below 
That's why you're seeing the Earth's surface start to come into view as we're heading into that orbital sunrise. Dragon right now about 570 meters in closing. We are about eight minutes away, a little less than eight minutes at this point until we hit waypoint zero. It's going to autonomously proceed through waypoint zero, and it's going to execute kind of a mini fly around maneuver. So swinging about 180 degrees from the bottom of station all the way up top, and that's going to put it onto the docking axis lined up with that docking adapter on the space facing side of the node two module. And that'll put us at waypoint one, which is just 220 meters away from station. And then they'll proceed immediately from there down to waypoint two, getting just 20 meters away from the docking port before we pause and then do that final go, no go for approach. <coughs> Once we get into that final approach, Dragon will slowly fly in again, just using those service section Dracos. Um, until it's just a few meters away, and then we'll hear a call out for what's known as CHOP. That's crew hands-off point. That's essentially just giving the crew a heads up not to initiate any manual aborts or try any manual control, because at that point, that close in, everything has to be done automated by the computer itself on board Dragon. So you'll hear CHOP call out just a couple of seconds before we get contact and capture. We were slated to dock uh, just a little over an hour from now, an hour and seven minutes. Um, but as we continue to move through the burns, we'll adjust that in real time. We are just five minutes, 45 seconds away from waypoint zero. And we're about to see uh, South America passing beneath the Dragon spacecraft as it's just about to pass over Chile. We're fully into that orbital sunrise at this point. We're going to have good lighting uh, for at least another 50 minutes until we enter into an orbital nighttime. And we're just five minutes away from waypoint zero, continuing to close in, just about 475 meters away from station. Again, during all of these maneuvers, we're using those, those Draco thrusters on board Dragon. We've got 16 of them around the vehicle. There's four in the forward bulkhead, which is what's looking directly at our camera right now. And as we get in closer, you'll be able to see those. Uh, they've got um, some larger expansion nozzles on them, and they're used for really the, the big pushing burns um, that Dragon executed over the last 19 hours to catch up to the space station. Um, as they're now pointing directly at station, you can probably guess we're not using those for these maneuvers at this point. Uh, we're using instead the ones around Dragon's service section. So that's just around the, the bottom part of the capsule, still on the capsule, not on uh, the trunk which occupies the space typically called the service module on other spacecraft. All of these thrusters are built directly into the Dragon spacecraft itself. Um, they're essentially around the same area that the really large Super Dracos are. Those are only used um, for abort scenarios on uh, either on the pad or during ascent. And then as soon as we get on orbit, those get disabled for the remainder of the mission. So those are not going to be used for anything today or anything for the rest of uh, the Crew Dragon Endeavor's flight. But we are using uh, the service section Draco thrusters. Each one of these provides about 90 pounds force of thrust. Um, so used for these uh, only maneuvers in space in vacuum, uh, but also attitude control during uh, the final phases of reentry. Uh, they're in clusters of three, so we got four clusters of three of these thrusters around uh, the base of the capsule, and these are going to be used for attitude control. So just which way the the vehicle's pointing, 
um, but then also for uh, those translational moves. So we're going to be doing one of those uh, in a little over three minutes after we get to waypoint zero. And we're going to see dragons start to fly first out in front of the station and eventually swinging just up over top until we get to waypoint two. We're just 430 meters away. So again, we're just about three minutes away from waypoint zero. And again, Dragon has a couple of tools available to it um, for this approach, for its navigation. Um, when we establish that bi-directional communication, we're able to establish what's known as relative GPS. So you have basically a GPS system on Dragon talking to a GPS system on board the station, trading their relative state data uh, as that provides the Dragonfly computer data to fine tune its maneuver. Well, as we're getting in close now, uh, we're going to start using some of the navigational elements on the very forward part of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, these are covered up by the uh, the nose cone during ascent, and then one of the first things we do when we get the nose cone open um, is you reveal these sensors that are going to be used for the approach and docking. Uh, you've got the Dragon Eye, which is used um, uses uh, what's commonly known as a LIDAR system, um, basically using lasers that bounce off of uh, reflective points on station to give distance data, range rate data, how quickly you're closing in. Um, we're also able to use uh, a thermal and an infrared camera. Um, there is a just a visible light camera on the very forward part of Dragon. Um, that will typically get some views. We got some views of the station from that earlier. That's not part of the actual navigation at all. That's just used um, for situational awareness. It can also be used uh, should the crew have to take over manual control. That'll be one of the uh, things feeding data into their manual control uh, piloting software that's built into those displays that uh, anytime we get a look over the uh, commander and the pilot's shoulder inside the capsule, you'll be able to see those displays and uh, they'll just have those up to monitor the approach, but then they can also use that um, should they need to take control and fly Dragon manually for any reason. So we are just about 30 seconds away from waypoint zero, just 411 meters away from station. So just a small bit to go, and then we'll be passing through our first waypoint. Again, we're gonna hit three of these on the way to docking today. We're gonna start with waypoint zero swinging up to waypoint one, just 220 meters away, and then eventually into uh, waypoint two, just 20 meters from the docking port. Uh, meanwhile, preparations on the station continue. We've done a couple that I talked about earlier just to get ready for this approach. Uh, we do something called feathering the solar arrays. It's just essentially pointing them in a direction to minimize their surface area that's pointing towards Dragon. Uh, as Dragon does these thruster firings, you're essentially expelling some gases, some um, some prop out into the vacuum of space, and that can leave residues on any sensitive surfaces. And so we just orient the, the solar arrays to basically show as little surface area as possible in the direction of these thruster firings, and just to minimize any residues getting on the solar cells. And this is standard for any visiting vehicle operation, and that's just one of the first uh, steps that you take as you get into these final approaches. Uh, we've also transitioned the station's uh, MCS motion control Space system. Station 2, Dragon attitude is as expected. That was NASA astronaut Rajachari radioing Dragon attitude as expected, so we've now uh, just passed waypoint zero. We're inside 400 meters away from the space station. And at this point, we're going to see Dragon start to do a maneuver, taking it up out in front of the station and then up over top, heading up to waypoint one. So it's going to essentially do a 180 degree swing around the station, going from directly beneath to directly above. It's going to line it Dragon, up with SpaceX uh, on the that big docking loop. adapter. Approach zero in progress. Trajectory has converged on waypoint one. 
Expect waypoint one arrival at approximately 1121 UTC. And then that call we just heard from CORE, so uh, the trajectory has aligned on waypoint one, and that's where we're headed next. That's that point right above the station. Uh, and we expect to be there uh, in about 34 minutes from now. Uh, all the times you're hearing called up are in uh, UTC or GMT, just that uh, Greenwich Mean Time, that universal standard time, uh, and that's what all of the different operators working space station ops will go off of as you have control centers in just about every time zone imaginable. Um, and so we use that UTC just to tie uh, everybody's planning and tracking together. So we're about 34 SpaceX minutes from waypoint one. On Dragon dragons. to ground. Hey Dragon, we've got you on Dragon to ground. Jake, did you get uh, Mike's transmissions both on the big band dragon to ground? Larry, that's a negative on both. Did not receive either transmission. I wonder if it's a Vox setting or uh, past that I'll keep thinking. Not sure. Thanks, we'll investigate on our end. And so we've heard them continue. They're, they're troubleshooting a couple of uh, different issues with the big loop, but we're still continuing to get that calm um, and not any uh, impedance towards continuing with our docking so far today. Dragon SpaceX, we got the last half of that call. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to Ground. Yeah, Jake, I'm not sure what to do here. Uh, I don't think it's a box setting because I'm definitely pressing the press to talk. I'm seeing the transmit light, light up when I'm talking the whole time, so I'm not sure what to do. Worst comes to worst, we rely on Larry to make the calls. Okay, copy all, MLA. I had you three by three on that call. Understand you don't think it's a Vox issue. Uh, would encourage troubleshooting, and I'm sure you are. Uh, we'll stand by for another big loop com check. Roger that. All right, we're continuing to check off milestones during this approach. We're already past waypoint zero on our way towards waypoint one. Dragon continuing to fly. As they MLA, continue to do a number of SpaceX communication on checks the with loop. the ground. We caught the second half of that call. Recommend pressing push to talk uh, and waiting a few seconds before starting a call. Dragon, we caught that entire transmission. All right, but right now, Dragon making it swing from waypoint zero to waypoint one. We're just about 30 minutes away. 
until Dragon's directly above the station and lined up on the docking axis with that international docking adapter. Uh, let's check back in with the Hawthorne team, though. Uh, Andy Trish, how's everything going over there in California? Uh, things are going good here, Dan. Um, uh, as we continue to watch Dragon, uh, things are uh, beginning to pick up pace as Dragon makes its way towards Waypoint 1. Uh, you know, for everyone tuning in, uh, we are hearing dialogue between Larry, Connor, the pilot uh, who is currently in Dragon Endeavor, uh, and uh, the Corps, which stands for Crew Operations uh, Resource Engineer here in Hawthorne. Uh, they are troubleshooting some communications, um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll likely continue to get uh, updates there. But uh, you also notice that there are some beeping uh, before the communications happen. Those are called, called Quindar tones. and. Uh, those are really just used to clear the air to make sure that the communication um, is as clear as possible from ground to dragon. Uh, but, you know, as part of the Axiom 1 mission, this is uh, SpaceX's sixth human spaceflight mission overall and the fifth to the orbiting lab. Uh, dragon has a long, long history of really being designed from the beginning with human spaceflight in mind. Uh, there is um, the uh, first Dragon capsule that is hanging uh, behind myself and Trisha here in Hawthorne. Um, and even uh, on the days of its inception, there was a window in place. And we weren't uh, sending people up into space at that time, but we knew that uh, sometime in the future we, we wanted to. So um, this, it's super exciting that, uh, you know, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but it, this is the sixth time that, that you know, we're, we're sending people up on Dragon. Yeah, that's certainly amazing. And if I understand correctly, that that first Dragon capsule was sent up with cheese? Yeah, um, the cheese was used as a mass simulator uh, for um, that, that capsule. And we've definitely come a long way since then. But uh, even between that capsule and what we're seeing here today, there has been numerous upgrades uh, to the Dragon capsule. Um, you know, first and foremost, with every flight uh, where we're taking crew, um, when they return, we, we collect all of the feedback to make sure that the next iteration of crew flight is as comfortable and a, a, a well-versed experience as possible for the, the um, incoming crew. So things like adding USB chargers, uh, reorganizing where to store and pack things, those are all feedback that we take into um, um, you know, reiteration of the Dragon's design. Uh, the, the Dragon capsule itself also has gone through a number of upgrades. Um, if you've been following um, the Dragon program, you'll notice that uh, we no longer have the solar arrays, uh, which would unfurl after Dragon separated from the second stage. The solar panels are actually built onto the trunk section itself. And so, um, you know, as Dragon gets closer, we'll likely see um, half of the trunk section colored black, and those are the, the solar panels that will collect energy um, and really power Dragon throughout its stay up in space. Absolutely, and you know, you mentioned that you guys, um, that SpaceX has had a, this is the sixth flight that you've had um, in collaboration with NASA, sending up NASA astronauts uh, to the ISS. Uh, this is um, Axiom's first, you know, um, mission in collaboration with companies like SpaceX and as well as our uh, government counterpart, NASA. It's a, this uh, first private astronaut mission is really setting the uh, precedent and serving as a case study for what these uh, partnerships and collaborations will look like in the future, you know, for future private astronaut missions, and as well as the Axiom station overall. Yeah, I think it's it marks a a, a turning point in in um, space travel. Uh, this is the first all private uh, mission, as you had mentioned. Um, and, and, you know, with all the signs that each of the crew members are going to be performing, um, it's just a tremendous, tremendous um, sort of milestone uh, in, the, in the space faring um, uh, world. Absolutely, and you know, in, in for in our view, it's really the next chapter of uh, the spaceflight industry. Uh, you know, during the launch broadcast, we heard uh, from Kathy Leaders uh, about how this was really the vision of spaceflight from the very beginning of NASA's program. You know, 60 years ago, they uh, really envisioned this to be. Um, you know, what it would evolve to so that they could focus on, you know, returning to the moon, going to Mars, and possibly even beyond in the future. So, you know, this is um, 
the ISS and NASA has been, they've been the pioneers in these kinds of relationships, all the logistics and training and everything it takes to put humans into space and low Earth orbit. And transitioning that to a commercialized partnership is going to mean that, you know, private sectors, private industries are going to need a lot of time um, and NASA's expertise in learning how to establish and maintain these relationships effectively. It's really a learning process uh, through all of these missions, um, you know, to get there. That's a really gorgeous view of the curvature of the Earth. Yeah, I think um, when we had started this broadcast, we had a phenomenal view uh, of Dragon um, in the, uh, I believe it was an orbital sunset, uh, but it, it looked like a painting with all the colors and, and Dragon <laughs> in the foreground. And, um, you know, as Dragon approaches the International Space Station, we're going to continue to get... Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground for audio troubleshooting. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to Ground, go ahead. Hey Larry, uh, quick update. We are still seeing good suit 2 telemetry via the pressure transducer. We don't suspect an umbilical issue, uh, but we're hoping to gain some confidence in this comm method as we head towards waypoint one. Uh, hoping MLA can give one more comm check on the big loop using the press, wait a second or two, and then talk method. Yeah, copy all, and uh, Michael giving another go on the uh, big loop using the revised technique. Apex Endeavor, I'm check on the big loop. Dragon SpaceX, I think we lost the S and P of SpaceX. Maybe another half second, but otherwise, sounds good. Okay, Jake, did you hear okay? That's a four by four call, MLA, uh, and good to hear. So again, the teams are continuing to work through and troubleshoot some communications. Um, looks like things are heading in the right direction. Uh, that, again, was uh, both MLA, the commander, and Larry, the pilot, talking to the core um, here at Hawthorne. Um, we talk about joint operations and, and all of the teams it takes to really uh, get vehicles to the International Space Station safely. Um, at Mission Control Houston, uh, there is a, a CAPCOM, which stands for Capsule Communicator. They're really responsible for uh, ground communications to the folks already aboard the International Space Station. Um, the flight director is adjacent to the CAPCOM, and they're really leading the team through major milestones. We also have ADCOs, which are um, attitude determination and control officers, and those that will uh, uh, that person's job is to control the attitude or orientation of the International Space Station. Um, so a lot of parties working together to make sure that um, the crew and the capsule um, and the folks at the International Space Station uh, are safe as we continue the stocking procedure. Absolutely. Um, and we also have our, for in terms of axiom, we also have our own, um, you know, similar positions like that. Um, some uh, some uh, of those positions include the axiom operations lead. This is essentially the equivalent to the flight operations director. They're in charge of leading the axiom's flight control team. Um, and for the PAM missions, they're uh, in charge of performing and managing the communication with the axiom crew. Uh, another uh, position that uh, will be especially relevant when the um, the crew gets on orbit and starts, uh, you know, conducting their research experience.
experiments will, uh, will be the Axiom Research Officer, whose job, um, whose responsibilities include uh, planning and coordinating Axiom payloads um, with the crew while they're on orbit, as well as interfacing with the payloads owners, who are, you know, the research institutions that the crew and Axiom has partnered with um, to send up research into space. So on the right-hand side, we have a view over the shoulders of uh, the Commander MLA and uh, Larry, the pilot, uh, in the uh, nifty SpaceX uh, spacesuits. These are intra, uh, user, these are used for IVAs or intra-vehicular activities, are really meant and designed for use inside of Dragon. Um, they are really um, a sort of space uh, system uh, in and of itself. Uh, they are a one-piece design, so everything from the helmet to the gloves to the boots, they're all attached. Um, the helmet is 3D printed, and as Dan was mentioning earlier, um, there is an umbilical on the right thigh uh, that hooks up to each of the seats um, for the crew members, and in that umbilical will house, um, you know, communications for the astronauts to communicate to ground, uh, as well as um, uh, lines for nitrox, uh, which again is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, same stuff that you would see in scuba tanks. Um, in the case of a depressurization event, the suits would um, inflate and you would get a nice flow of nitrox through to make sure that the astronauts are safe and have a habitable, habitable environment. Um, but for now, you see that the visors are up and uh, you know, every time that we, we uh, don or, or put on the spacesuits, we, we always run our leak check to make sure that, again, in case of an event uh, where we're losing pressure, um, the astronauts would be safe. Beautiful shot there of the ISS on the right. So those suits, I mean, they they look pretty cool, but you know, they they are, um, from what I understand, pretty uh, comfortable for the crew. You know, that nitrous ox line it really serves to um, keep the crew comfortable um, and uh, c conditioned um, while they're wearing it, um, and it's pretty uh, pretty customized uh, for each crew member. Yeah, um, we, we do take a lot of measurements to make sure that the, the suit itself is form-fitted. Um, the chairs that they're sitting in are also um, able to be customized. There are different size buckets, small, small, medium, large, and um, the length of the armrest is also customizable. So um, comfort is definitely something that we take into mind uh, when we are suiting up um, the, the team members. So this mission um, really is a mission of first. The, the four-person multinational crew includes um, Michael Lopez Alegria, the first person to command a mission as both a government astronaut and a private astronaut. Larry Connor, the first uh, private astronaut pilot in spaceflight history. Uh, Eitan Stiba, the second Israeli astronaut and the first to live and work on the International Space Station. And Mark Pathy, who will become the 11th uh, um, Canadian astronaut. It's also the first mission to the space station with all commercial providers, including the ride to space, uh, the SpaceX Dragon launching on SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Certainly a very significant event for all of them and for the countries they're representing and really for the global uh, audience. Um, it also breaks new training ground. The AX-1 astronauts are the first all-private crew to complete NASA's training flow. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, each AX-1 crew member completed between 700 and 1,000 hours of training in safety, health, ISS systems, launch site operations, and additional training for research and technology demonstrations uh, and uh, uh, for their payloads to prepare for the mission. It's also a very serious science and research-focused effort. Uh, you know, more than 25 research investigations are planned during the mission, including some pretty cool Axiom Space Managed experiments like the Tesseray prototype, which is, uh, you know, a self-assembling space habitat made, of a, made out of robotic tiles, and the JAMS air purification demonstration where they're looking into uh, technology for, you know, for things like air purification. Um, all of these are very helpful and will definitely have implications for uh, life on Earth. Um, 
the crew members, uh, the you know three crew members who are the first-time flyers, Larry, Mark, and Aton, they also uh, were able to curate their own research portfolios. Um, they worked with several research institutions, hospitals, museums around the world uh, to coordinate these experiments, and they'll also be able to host several science outreach and engagement activities while on orbit. Um, their research investigations range from biological studies, such as cells tied to help better understanding aging, to biomedical research on spine, cardiac, and brain health. Yeah, so on the right-hand side, um, you can see that um, the astronauts and crew members are interacting with the LCD screens. Uh, those will give the crew a ton of information about the vehicle, things like uh, altitude, uh, which engines are firing, and um, uh, right here, we, we just saw it, but we saw some plumes and, and bursts of, um, of, of the uh, Draco thrusters on Dragon. So uh, that view that was just up on screen, that is the International Space Station looking at Dragon as it approaches and continues to make its way towards Waypoint. It's about 220 meters away from the International Space Station. So things continuing to look good there. Uh, this shot here is a view of uh, Mission Control in Hawthorne. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, before when we had the, the dual pan up, we also had a view of Dragon looking at the International Space Station. So uh, very, very cool views. Absolutely. Some of the other, you know, really fantastic uh, technology that uh, the crew will be looking at on board, in particular, Mark Pathy will be testing a 3D two-way holoportation device. Uh, you know, the self-assembling space habitat wasn't exciting enough. They'll be uh, looking at this holoportation device, which is a mixed reality app using special lenses to project images via holograms. The innovation could be used to connect astronauts with loved ones on Earth on future long-duration space missions to combat feelings of isolation and loneliness. And you know, as NASA sets their sights on you know going to returning to the Moon, going to Mars, and you know even beyond, those questions and behavioral wellness issues become you know more and more relevant, um, you know, in those situations. Yeah, it was uh, super neat to read all about all the science that's being done, specifically the, the, the test array experiment where you have uh, these modules that can be uh, packed and sent up to space uh, in, uh, nice and flat. And then in space, they are self-assembling, which is, uh, you know, sort of mind-blowing to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, the crew is also partnering with, with the Trish um, uh, Research uh, Institute to um, study basically all the things that happen to your body when you're in a microgravity environment, and all that data is collected uh, and returned back to Earth, and um, you know can be used for future science endeavors, which is um, super awesome that the crew is doing this. Absolutely, and I want to go back and touch on the um, that Tesseray experiment. You mentioned that you can you're able to pack it flat and then send it up into space, where it's then you know self assembling essentially. That is um, a huge savings in terms of up mass, um, which, you know, directly translates to cost um, for missions like that. So, you know, usually when, for example, we send up a module, uh, this, you know, becomes relevant for Axiom Station, you have to send the module, you know, structure assembled um, and then launch that up into space. But with technology like the self-assembling robotic tiles, you know, the Tesseray experiment, you could potentially send that you know, flat, save a lot of space and a lot of mass, and then have that assembled in orbit um, by itself, which saves also a lot of crew time um, when talking about outfitting um, modules in space. So just some super exciting experiments um, in manufacturing research that could also help to benefit uh, us on Earth. I mean, I can think of a lot of ways that self-assembling tiles would benefit, um, you know, the manufacturing industry here every day. Yeah, it would be super cool to basically potentially buy a self-assembling home and just <laughs> yeah, set it up. <laughs> it really would. <laughs> um, we don't have any shots of uh, Dragon and or the ISS right now, but I'm sure we'll get them back soon. Uh, as Dragon continues its way towards uh, Waypoint 1, which is um, sh it should reach in under 15 minutes here and makes its way towards uh, Waypoint 2, this is also the point where its soft docking ring will start to uh, deploy. 
Uh, the way that the Dragon works in terms of docking is there is a soft docking ring, and on that ring are three pedals. And as Dragon makes contact with the um, docking adapter on the International Space Station side, that those pedals and docking ring are what makes first contact. And so it'll sort of um, attach itself via those rings and pedals. And then there are two sets of six hooks that will drive into place and um, that will be what we call hard capture. And so at that stage, that's when um, you know, sort of docking is complete, but it's done in, in a couple of different um, stages. Absolutely. So, and, yeah, um, so sorry, we, we <laughs> might hear the call out that um, that procedure has started. So, you know, Tricia and I will definitely be listening in for that. Yeah, we certainly will be. Um, in the meantime, though, it's uh, noteworthy to, it, it's worth spending time on the fact that, you know, the crew is representing four different countries, America, Spain, Israel, and Canada, for outreach in five different languages. So, you know, a large component of their mission objectives are um, conducting excellent science. But in addition to that, they're also helping to inspire people on Earth to pursue science and engineering studies. The crew represents, as I mentioned earlier, four countries and will com be completing uh, outreach experiments and uh, events in five languages, specifically Spanish, Hebrew, French, English, and Arabic, which you know just helps to uh, uh, contribute to expanding efforts to connecting with more people around the world. Um, you know, the crew is able to bring up some, um, you know, things as well. And, and Stibber will be br uh, bring surviving pages of the diary written in space by the first Israeli pilot, uh, Israeli astronaut, uh, Ilan Ramon, who died um, February 1st, 2003, when Space Shuttle Columbia and crew perished during reentry. He will also bring a painting created by Ramon's daughter and a song written by his son. So definitely a great nod to, um, you know, the first Israeli astronaut. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, in a similar vein, uh, uh, Larry Connor will be, sh he shares an Ohio, uh, Ohio heritage with actually the Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, who he will also be bringing along a small piece of cloth used by the Wright brothers on the first ever powered flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903. So, you know, a lot of history there and, you know, being represented on the ISS. Um, it's just the beginning, really, for Axiom Space. AX-1 is the first of several proposed Axiom missions to the orbiting laboratory, and it's an important step towards Axiom's goal of constructing a private space station, um, Axiom Station, in low Earth orbit. Um, it'll serve as the global academic and commercial hub, and like I mentioned earlier, will really be the next chapter in opening up low Earth orbit to um, in research institutions and even governments um, around the world. So for now, we are um, under 10 minutes now uh, for Dragon to reach Waypoint 1, uh, getting awesome views of Dragon. So um, the hatch is open, and there is a center line camera uh, at the center, um, basically, of Dragon. That That is what Dragon is using to line itself up with the um, uh, docking target on uh, the International Space Station. Um, but yeah, things are continuing to go smoothly. I'm um, going to send it back over to Dan at JSC uh, for updates. Hey, thanks, Andy and Trish. Uh, we are just seven minutes away from arrival at Waypoint One. And so Dragon right now only just under 330 meters away from the station. It's continuing this uh, spin from underneath station to directly above. We're gonna line up on the docking axis at waypoint one, just 220 meters away from international docking adapter number three, which is on the space facing port of the Harmony module. Harmony hosts both of the international docking adapters on the station right now, which is used for uh, all U.S. commercial docking vehicles. So far, Dragon, the only one to make use of it, both the cargo and the crew variants. And we've got another crew Dragon dock to station that delivered our SpaceX Crew 3 astronauts. And pretty soon we're going to have a second one, Crew Dragon Endeavor. 
So in just about six minutes, we'll hit waypoint one, and then we're going to continue on in from there. The team's already getting the go to continue into waypoint two. Uh, and waypoint two will be just 20 meters away from the docking port on that space facing side of Harmony. And then we'll pause at waypoint two before we begin that final approach. And so all of this, again, being done autonomously by the flight computers on board Dragon. We've got three redundant ones that are constantly calculating its position relative to the station. While we were still quite a bit further away, we were relying on GPS and star trackers uh, to fine tune Dragon's path towards the station. Uh, ever since we got in closer, we've been using uh, as the primary means the Dragon Eye system, which uses a combination of different navigational tools. Uh, one of the primary ones is a form of LIDAR laser range finding, where we're essentially bouncing lasers off of reflectors on the station and then those sensors are able to tell how long it took for that laser to travel back and that gives you a distance output immediately. And so it's using those um, to constantly ping with station. Uh, Dragon Eye also has an infrared camera set up uh, that the crew can use should they need to take manual control. And we use infrared uh, as it doesn't matter what the lighting conditions are, that camera is usable. Um, so even if we're in a complete orbital nighttime, the crew could use that camera. Um, and there's a shot with the half moon also uh, in the distance behind Dragon as it is almost directly above space station at this point. We're just four minutes away from waypoint number one. Uh, and as Andy said, there's a couple of additional cameras on Dragon. Um, there's two pointing directly out of that top hatch. There's a centerline camera and one that's just known as a media camera, just giving us additional views of, dra of space station from Dragon, um, not used at all in the actual guidance and navigation control, um, but just something that uh, we get to use uh, to bring you along for the ride. And also importantly, just gives additional situational awareness for teams um, on just relative positioning of Dragon. But we've not had any issues so far with our approach. We're just about three and a half minutes from waypoint one. We don't have video from the space station right now. Unfortunately, we are gonna have a couple of gaps just as we get into the really interesting phases as Dragon gets in close, but we'll get that video back pretty quickly. Um, we have all of that signal coming down uh, from station through those TDRS, the tracking data and relay satellites. Uh, every once in a while, uh, the antennas that point towards those satellites might get blocked uh, by some piece of station structure, um, and that can cause the dropouts or when we're just uh, out of the range uh, of the satellites themselves, we'll usually do a, what's known as a handover as we just transition between the different TDRS satellites. But we'll have a little bit of blockage uh, during the final approach phases, but uh, we should have good views of Dragon during uh, that docking portion. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. We're two minutes out from waypoint one. Approach one and soft capture ring extension will begin shortly. Dragon will continue approach to waypoint two. As a reminder, manual impulsive retreat recovery is not permitted. All right, just two minutes away from waypoint one. All of this being done autonomously on Dragon. We've got Dragon, a couple of SpaceX additional on backstops Dragon ground. if needed. For your awareness, we did not get a read back on the big loop if one was provided. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to ground. Uh, we'll investigate and be back to you. We're about 90 seconds away. Would provide any response, and I waited probably two, maybe three seconds after keeping the mic and start speaking, so I'm not sure what else to do. Would you like to have Larry try a comp check on the big group? Copy all, MLA. We had you three by three there on Dragon to Ground. 
Good suggestion for Larry to try the big loop. We'll stand by. SpaceX is never on the big loop. Copy. Dragon, SpaceX, we've got you five by five on the big loop with an echo. Make sure you're only, oh, sorry, stand by. Uh, good to go. Okay, MLA on Dragon to Ground, copy all, and understood. All right, so at this moment, while they were conducting those kind of final comm checks, again, we've been troubleshooting a few issues with uh, the spacecraft commander, Mike L.A., uh, to be able to talk on the big loop. But, Dragon and station uh, SpaceX Larry, on the big Connor loop. not having Spectre any issues. Spectre reconfiguration of the C2V2 link shortly. Uh, copy all, Jake. C2V2 reconfiguration. And so they're going to reconfigure C2V2, that's the cloud on communications attitude. for visiting vehicles. Copy, thanks, Tom. The station crew reporting Dragon any attitude that they expect as they monitor Dragon during its final approach. Teams down here on the ground reporting that the docking station, ring the is beginning to extend out. So that'll be used for the soft six, capture. And we're ready for docking. Copy that, Tom. Ready for docking. And that was Station Commander Tom Marshburn reporting the station crew is ready for the approach and docking. Uh, just as they continue to step through their procedures, you heard five and six. Uh, five actually has them get a cue to radio down to the ground that they're ready. Um, we'll also uh, hear a chop call out come. Uh, that's that crew hands off point as we get into the final stages of approach. But for right now, we are just under nine and a half minutes away from waypoint two arrival. Um, and so waypoint two is just 20 meters outside of the space station. Uh, we'll, we'll hang out there probably for about a minute or so while the teams do their final go, no go for docking. Uh, flight Director TJ Creamer here in the space station flight control room leading the integrated teams. So we've been in what's known as integrated operations for the last several hours. Um, and that just speaks to uh, the time when Dragon is close enough in towards the station, uh, when the SpaceX and the space station flight control teams are kind of working hand in hand as they go through all of these different checkpoints, getting the go from the station side before Dragon proceeds. And so the docking ring on Dragon is beginning to extend. That's going to be used for that initial contact and capture. Uh, Andy gave a really great description. There's three uh, pedals on the docking ring on Dragon that are basically going to guide it in um, for that first uh, capture moment with a passive system on the station side in that international docking adapter. Uh, after that docking ring then gets retracted, That'll bring Dragon close enough in to enable a series of 12 hooks. And that'll give us a hard mate after that point. Uh, we can continue with a couple of the other post-docking activities, uh, like extending an umbilical that's going to integrate uh, hardline communications data and power between Dragon and the space station.
So in the meantime, we're just about seven and a half minutes away from arrival at waypoint two. And per the timeline, just about 17 minutes and 45 seconds from our expected docking time, uh, which was originally slated at about 6.45 a.m. Uh, Central Time, 11.45 GMT. So again, that time is just updating uh, automatically on board Dragon as it calculates its amount of time that it's going to spend at each of these waypoints, uh, the duration of the burns and the approaches. But at this point, we're under seven minutes away from waypoint two, Dragon just about 144 meters away from the station. And as expected, we've slowed down quite a bit. So as we initially fly in, we're, we were flying at about three or four meters per second. And that was just the relative velocity between uh, the Dragon spacecraft and station. At this point, uh, we're closer to a crawl. We're moving at about three tenths of a meter per second as Dragon flies in. So it's just doing very fine fine tuning maneuvers at this point using those service section Dracos. So no thrusters are firing right now. It's still uh, coasting off of its forward momentum. We might see those thruster plumes fire depending on lighting conditions as we get uh, just up to waypoint two where we're gonna hold with Dragon just 20 meters away from the space station docking port. And there you can see some of those thruster firings now as the lighting conditions do change. Again, at this point, we're just using the service section Dracos. So they're around kind of the base of the capsule portion. There's 12 of them in total uh, in four clusters of three. And those are all being fired automatically. Uh, Dragon calculating its path in using the Dragon Eye at this point, bouncing lasers off the space station to see exactly how far away it is, what its uh, range rate, how quickly it's flying in, and then adjusting in real time using those Dracos. All right, so we are under five minutes away from arrival at waypoint two. So that'll be our final waypoint. And then we'll be ready for the final go, no go for docking, just about 15 minutes away from the expected docking time. So let's check in over at Hawthorne with Andy and Trisha, getting exciting, getting Dragon in real close. Uh, we're, we're in the final stages. How ready are you to see this Dragon dock to station? Uh, very ready. Uh, we continue to get awesome views of Dragon. Uh, we are about a minute and a half away from an orbital sunset. So, uh, Dan, uh, I think you had already predicted, but lighting conditions might change a little bit. Uh, but for now, things are continuing to go uh, super smoothly. Um, if you look closely um, at the center of Dragon, uh, Dan had talked a lot about the forward bulkhead thrusters. There are some uh, holes that you can see on the bottom um, of that circular um, uh, for bulkhead. Um, there's two more that aren't really well lit, but um, those are where... Dragon and Station SpaceX, C2V2 link reconfiguration, and soft capture ring extension complete. SpaceX, Endeavor, copy all. So those are where uh, four of those uh, 16 uh, Dracos are housed. And we just heard that uh, the soft capture extension has completed, uh, which is a great milestone to hit as we are uh, getting closer and closer to uh, the International Space Station and docking just a few minutes from now. Yeah, if uh, you know we're excited about docking, I can only imagine what the crew really feels like. You know, I'm sure, uh, you know, they've had a long journey to here, but once they get there and they uh, they ingress into the station, um, they'll be, you know hitting the ground running. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the um, volume of science experiments that they'll be uh, completing while on orbit. Um, let's talk a little bit more in detail of what the uh, three first-time flyers are bringing to the station. 
So first off, our AX1 mission pilot, Larry Connor, has partnered with several research institutions across the U.S. to study aging, heart, and brain health. He'll be a participant in studies as well on heart function and brain and spine health. He will participate in tests and MRIs before and after the emission to really test uh, the effects of microgravity exposure on the human body. He will also conduct cell cultures in space. Uh, he was specifically trained for this, um, you know, uh, to be able to handle these cells while on orbit. And he'll be studying how the age cells respond to the microgravity and radiation of space as stressors as well. Next, our mission uh, specialist one, Eitan Stiva, is conducting a variety of studies selected from across Israel in partnership with the Ramon Foundation and the Israel Space Agency. He'll be, study he will be monitoring eye health, cognitive performance, and stress while in space. Other topics selected for uh, the Rakia mission that he's flying under will uh, include the microbiome, fluidics and optics, plastics recycling, cardiovascular health, radiation protection, and other tests of technology and equipment. He will also be observing the Earth's atmosphere for thunderstorms to better understand how lightning is coupled in the upper and lower atmospheres. And on top of all of that, he will also, been, also be conducting several education and artistic activities to inspire children back home on Earth. This includes reading a Hebrew poem from space for the first time. Uh, and Mark Pathy has partnered with multiple Canadian research universities, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and the Montreal Children's Hospital to conduct a variety of STEM studies. For the Montreal Children's Hospital, Pathy is examining musculoskeletal pain. The aim is to better understand the genetics and cellular pathways of pain and how the microgravity environment could contribute to pain sensation. Pathy will conduct in other biomedical experiments as well. Endeavor on the big loop. Uh, all visors down. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. We copy all. Expect a hold at waypoint two for ISS troubleshooting. Dragon systems remain healthy. Teams working on it. Stand by for more. Understood. Copy all, and we'll be holding at waypoint two. So, a quick update from the core: uh, things are all uh, looking well, and we are going to be holding at waypoint two, which is coming up in in about a minute uh, on screen. Uh, now that we've um, uh, we have an orbital night. Uh, Dragon, and you can see all of the different Draco thrusters around the surface section of the capsule beginning to fire. Uh, all of these micro adjustments and micro movements are all autonomous from the Dragon vehicle. As Dan had mentioned, um, the Dragon vehicle is extremely smart, um, and so it knows where it's at, where it needs, what it needs to do to maintain a position and uh, dock successfully here in a couple of minutes. So continuing on with uh, Mark Pathy's research, uh, he'll, be con uh, he'll be participating in other biomedical experiments as well. He'll be wearing a biomonitor while exercising to record heart, lung, and circulation performance. He'll monitor changes in sleep and eye health, and he'll also test an augmented reality device intended to assist with medical care in the event of an emergency. At Houston Station on the big loop, we show ourselves in step four of 1.102, confirm it's in hold. Altitude uh, looks good, and we are still waiting for video views. Copy that, Tom. We are working on video right now. Stand by for more words. So as we're approaching waypoint two, uh, let's head back over to Dan over at JSC for some more updates. Hey, thanks, Trisha and Andy. So as you heard, Dragon is at waypoint two. So we're just 20 meters away from station and we're holding here. Uh, all systems continue to be go. Uh, the mission director at Hawthorne has given their go for docking. Uh, we're currently just troubleshooting some video accessibility for the crew on board station before the station team's ready to give their final go for docking. So we'll just hang out here at waypoint two. Again, this is why we build in these different kind of checkpoints along the way 
and we go through a series of go no goes just to confirm everything's working as we expect before we continue in. So Dragon's just going to hang out here for a little bit, 20 meters away. The team's here on the ground in Houston troubleshooting video for the crew on board. Uh, they did report down that they're still getting good data from Dragon. It's in the proper attitude. Um, so everything looking good uh, from the station perspective. And as soon as we get this video uh, troubleshot and figured out, we'll be ready to continue on with docking. It'll be pretty quick from that final approach, just 20 meters away to the docking. Um, again, we're going to have an initial contact and capture using the soft docking mechanism on board Dragon. It's been fully extended at this point, and it's going to link up with that international docking adapter that just has a passive mechanism on it. Um, and then after that initial contact, the soft capture ring will start to retract um, on the docking system on board Dragon, bringing it in um, for a hard mate, at which point we'll be able to engage 12 hooks. Uh, found around the uh, nose cone the section of Dragon loop. to lock it in. FYI, we're trying to send video to SSC-8. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. The issue we're troubleshooting has to do with crew video from the centerline camera. Can you confirm that the Dragon crew is able to view the station through your... Hey, copy on the big loop uh, on SSC-8. We see the same indications. We've got a counting up ET time, but uh, no, no video indication. Copy that. Give us two minutes, and we're hoping it'll be there. Endeavor. Let's go, let's go. That's incredible. We have good uh, video on both center line one and center line two. Is that what was that the question? Dragon SpaceX copied the first half, did hear the words good video. Uh, if you could uh, elaborate what the second half of the call was. SpaceX Endeavor, my call was that we have good video on both center line one and center line two cameras and displays one and three respectively. Copy all, Dragon. Thank you. Okay, so just to walk you through what we're listening to right now. Uh, there is a center line camera on the Dragon spacecraft and that video gets transmitted wirelessly from the Dragon capsule over to the station uh, using that C2V2, that common communication for visiting vehicles. That's that connection that's been uh, sending uh, data, voice, video between station uh, and Dragon, allowing they those crews to talk to each other, loop. but also allowing... Video should be on SSC-8. Can you check for us, please? Uh, yep, still no joy. We've got the lab camera pointed at that screen as well, so you can see what we're seeing. Copy, we see it. Still assessing. But again, essentially what we're trying to do is get the view from that centerline camera up to the crew uh, that they're able to watch that video through a display um, that has overlays just as part of the crew monitoring of that final approach is there uh, in the in essentially in the in the chain of command for monitoring dragon and also potentially sending abort commands or anything of that nature so uh, one of our flight rules is we need that center line video to be available to the station crew um, and we did get confirmation that that camera is giving good video to the crew on Dragon. So the team's right now just troubleshooting a couple of steps to get that video to the SSC, the space station support computer that the crew's using for monitoring. So they're trying a couple of different computers. They're going to try a couple of resets and reconfigs uh, to get that video up and running for the crew. 
so right now we're just hanging out at waypoint two or about 20 meters away from the space station we can continue to hold here uh, while they troubleshoot um, and again we're just we're just waiting for that video issue to get worked out for the crew and then as soon as we get that we can continue on with the docking um, which will come shortly after we're able to depart waypoint two Again, we're just going to hang out about 20 meters Roger, away from the station. Roger, on the big loop, we copy potential version issue right there. Lost the end of your cause. We went through a, a mask on KU. and then getting some views inside the Dragon capsule. And uh, one of the ones that we just had was that center line. So that's the video that we're working on getting uh, up to the station crew, which they then will have uh, on one of their station support computers. And it has an overlay over it um, that just shows uh, a couple of different telemetry feeds and on the big as loop, well. And that's uh, just said, part of uh, their setup. KU. So yeah, on the Dragon docking monitor, the version that's open on the SSC-8 says Dragon docking monitor version 1.3. Uh, in the execute note, it says Dragon crew be version 3.1. So I don't know if those are just transposed or if there's actually a, a version misconfig. But what is what is possibly chosen on the SSCs is 1.3. Copy. Stand by. close and reopen that window while you're watching if you want to see the choices that come up. In standby one, we are assessing. Give us one more minute. And Raja, back with you on two. First of all, thanks for uh, giving us the added information. The configuration you're seeing with the three decimal one and the one decimal three, those are expected. That's what we want you to see. For troubleshooting, what we want you to do is go to SSC 17 and SSC 8, close docking monitor on both, and then reopen only on SSC 8 in the lab. How copy? We'll close uh, the docking monitor on 17 in the cupola and close it on 8 in the lab and then reopen it only on 8. Good copy. Thanks. Okay, Capcom Scott Segati here in Houston giving some troubleshooting steps to NASA astronaut Raj Atari on board the station. Again, Dragon right now, we're just holding at waypoint 2, just about 20 meters away from the station while we troubleshoot an issue getting video from the Dragon centerline camera to the crew and their support computer on station. That's a requirement for their monitoring during this final approach. So Roger was just given the instructions to go to two of the different SSCs, the station support computers, one located in the station's cupola and then one located in the Destiny laboratory and he's going to essentially turn the monitoring application off on the computer on both of those and then return to the one in the Destiny lab to restart it and hopefully that will fix our video issue. So everybody just uh, on board. Uh, it is reopened on 8. We're seeing similar indications with a counting up MET and a no video at the top. Copy that. Stand by. So they're continuing to troubleshoot this view from Dragon, looking straight down the barrel of the international docking adapter, continuing to essentially just float stationary, just about 20 meters away from that docking port. And again, we're continuing to go through some IT support steps, some troubleshooting uh, to get 
a live video from that centerline camera from Dragon over to the station crew on their monitoring computers as that's one of the requirements that's in place station Houston, for that on the final big approach loop. monitoring you please go hands off on SSC-8. We're going to do some configuration from here. We are hands off SSC-8. Thank you. And so now at this point, the crew is going to go hands off. So SSC, again, that station support computer, essentially just a laptop um, that's used. There's several of them throughout all of station that the crew uses uh, to support different applications, different hardware, different experiments. Uh, so they're going to go hands off. And then the flight controller here in Houston, known as Pluto, uh, will essentially serve as the uh, IT support in this case. It's going to go on board and try and do some reconfiguration work remotely on the software. And then once we're able to get that uh, centerline camera video up and running for the crew, we can proceed. So they're just holding Dragon 20 meters away. Um, we have plenty of consumables, plenty of capability to remain here at Waypoint 2 for an extended period of time to troubleshoot. Um, so right now the AX-1 astronauts inside Dragon suited up, visors down just 20 meters away from the space station. And then while we continue to troubleshoot uh, this centerline video issue, getting it to the crew, um, once we get that completed, we'll be able to proceed with docking. And so this was the first hiccup in a, a pretty smooth flight so far uh, for Dragon on its way to the station. And all indications uh, from Dragon not tracking any issues on the spacecraft, and they were able to confirm uh, that we're getting that. any issues on the spacecraft, and they were able to confirm uh, that we're getting that centerline camera both on board and we're able to see it uh, down here on the ground. So just working. Uh, the disconnect Dragon, and getting it on towards Dragon the ground station for crew. status update. Go ahead, Jay. Hey, Mike. The station is working through a video routing issue for them to see what you are seeing on displays one and three. We obviously can't stay at waypoint two forever, but we are staying for now. We anticipate at least two hours of hold time limited by propellant. And I wish I could, but I can't comment for sure how long this hold will last. How copy? Jake, believe me, we feel your pain. Um, we understand what's going on. We'll stay here as long as you tell us. Copy all, Dragon. Sit tight. And we got an update from the core that we have at least two hours um, to troubleshoot. Hopefully not that long, but at least two hours of, of prop margin to continue to hold at waypoint two um, while they work this video routing issue. Uh, this is the last item. And then as soon as we get this centerline video up to the crew, we'll be able to proceed in uh, with the docking. They'll have everything that they need for their approach monitoring capabilities uh, on board the space station. And then we'll be able to proceed with docking. Um, this is the centerline camera on Dragon looking straight down at the station. And again, we're directly above them. So you're starting to see some city lights pass in uh, the distance there um, from those views. And we're going to continue in this orbital nighttime for about 13 more minutes, and then we'll see the sun start to rise. Uh, we will have a couple of gaps coming up uh, with some of our video coverage uh, right around the same time the sun starts to come up. Uh, but otherwise, we should continue to get pretty steady views from the space station. Again, we're just holding at waypoint two, Dragon just 20 meters away from its docking port uh, as teams here in Mission Control Houston troubleshoot a video issue, getting the view from that centerline camera on Dragon uh, to the crew 
to one of their support computers that they're going to use for monitoring during this final approach. And that's in our flight rules is just one of those items that needs to be operational before the teams can give the joint go uh, to continue in. So the teams are discussing what our options are while they continue to work through this troubleshooting steps. But we've got approximately two hours of margin uh, in the propellant for Dragon to just continue to hang here at waypoint two, just about uh, 20 meters away from the space station. So it's holding itself stationary, flying essentially in formation with the orbiting lab. And then once we get the center line video issue fixed, we can proceed in with the docking. And at this point, uh, the team here, Mission Control Houston, has jumped in and uh, has been running some remote steps uh, from down here onto that support computer. Uh, the crew has gathered inside the Destiny Laboratory on board station at one of our two uh, monitoring stations, essentially. Uh, we have one down in the cupola in the window that looks directly down towards the Earth uh, where Raja Chari was initially for the monitoring. We also have an additional one in the Destiny Lab, both also equipped with full robotics workstations uh, that we use for controlling the space station's robotic arm, uh, but also for these uh, monitoring of these visiting vehicle operations. So the team's just continuing to figure out what the issue could be. Again, we've confirmed we've got good centerline video camera on board Dragon uh, and teams able to see it down here on the ground and just trying to work what that disconnect is uh, with the crew on station getting that video. And this is Mission Control Houston again. We're just continuing to hold for the moment, waiting for teams to troubleshoot a video issue uh, on board. Again, one of the, the final Thank systems you, we have Thank to have in seven. place. Yeah, Roger, I wanted to give you an idea of what we're doing right here. So we have uh, a primary plan where Pluto is currently working right now to try to get an alternate means to get you video using VLC. We are working on that right now. If that does not solve this issue here, our backup plan is that SpaceX has a ground pass coming by at 1223 where they will be picking up video. Um, so the alternate plan will be once we hit there, we're going to try to pipe in the video uh, directly to you through that SpaceX ground site. 
Um, that's what we're looking at right now. We currently are at about two hours left that we can stay at waypoint two at this point. I'll copy. Hey, copy. Uh, VLC plan alpha is the primary plan. We see that um, SSC-8 uh, being worked. And then if that doesn't work, the backup plan is to try to get uh, video piped in once we have a SpaceX ground coverage of 1223 and copy about two hours of consumables to hold at uh, current position. Good copy. Thanks, Raja. And we just heard a recap of our current situation from the Capcom here in Houston, Scott Sagitti. So again, our advisors, so check us on the way in if we can want to get cleared in. Houston Station on two for crew constraints. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground. I have to apologize, I didn't get your yeah, Just checking in if the crew no exercise um, constraint bands that is currently about to expire, if that will be uh, extended based on the current um, delay. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. Can you repeat your last? I'm going to mute my other channels and listen only to you. You know, Jake, I don't have the ability to do that, so I'd like to wait for this conversation to end on the big loop, and then I'll repeat it. So a quick recap of our current situation. Crew Dragon Endeavor still holding at waypoint two, just about 20 minutes away from its dock, intended docking port on the International Space Station. We've got about two hours, a little less now, of consumables, uh, essentially propellant, where we can continue to hold here at waypoint two while we troubleshoot an issue getting video over to the crew monitoring on board the space station. So that's one of the uh, checks we have to have in place uh, for their ability to monitor final approach. So the Pluto flight controller here in Houston is going through a number of steps uh, right now, trying to get them video through an alternate path uh, through a video program on board. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground, ready to copy. Jake, what I was saying is, in anticipation of uh, some kind of a practice, protracted delay here, we have raised our visors, so be sure to double check with us uh, if and when we get cleared to go back in. Dragon, copy all. Visors raised and absolutely understand. Uh, we'll be in touch uh, with any sort of forward plan. I'm sure you're copying on the big loop that troubleshooting is occurring on the ISS side. Uh, we've got a lot of chatter on the ground about what to do here. Uh, thank you for your patience. Understand visors are up, and I'll be in touch with more shortly. Good work, Jake. Thank you. And the AX-1 crew taking their visors up, seats or their suits not pressurized. Uh, as they continue to hold just 20 meters away from station. So again, we'll continue to hold here at waypoint two. Uh, the teams here on the ground troubleshooting issues, find, trying to find now an alternate path to get that centerline camera video to Rajachari and the crew on station who have to monitor during that final approach. Uh, if their current troubleshooting doesn't work, we've got a ground pass coming up in about 24, 25 minutes from now um, where Dragon will be passing over a SpaceX-supported ground site, which also has the capability to get that centerline video down, and then we'll have another option to try and route that over to the space station crew. So 
troubleshooting continued. We're going to wait until we get the centerline camera video up and running before we continue with the docking. Uh, but for now, we're just stepping through the troubleshooting. So with that, why don't we jump over and check in with Andy and Tricia. Uh, as again, we're just standing by here for this issue to get resolved. So Andy. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, Trish and I are also, you know, standing by, and uh, hopefully we hear good news uh, from all of the folks uh, here uh, 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 back on Earth uh, trying to troubleshoot the video issue. Um, you know, as you, uh, you as you had mentioned, um, it's been otherwise a very, very smooth ride uphill, and this is really the first hiccup that we've seen. So, again, um, we have a couple of options that we are looking into, but uh, for now, um, Dragon is just parked about 20 meters away at waypoint two, waiting for a path forward. So Dragon has been uh, on its journey to the International Space Station um, for about 20 hours now. And so after Dragon had separated from Falcon 9, it began what we call the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, Dragon uh, uh, was configured for on-orbit operations. This phase begins after Dragon separates from Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final colliptic burn. The initial orbit that uh, the Dragon was in was about 190 kilometers by 210 kilometers. Those values represented the perigee and the apogee of the orbit respectively, or in other words, the lowest and the highest point over Earth. That means that the orbit wasn't a perfect circle, but, you know, more like a, a slight ellipse. Yeah, and over um, the next couple of hours, Dragon executed a series of burns, which gradually raised its orbit to align more closely with the station. Um, on screen right now is a graphic. Um, so there are four major burns or firing of the Draco thrusters on Dragon that uh, brought the spacecraft closer and closer to the ISS. The first was a boost burn. Um, this is based on orbital data. And um, this raises Dragon's orbit until its orbit reaches an altitude of just 10 kilometers lower than the space station. It was followed soon after by a close co-elliptic burn uh, to place, uh, that placed Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station, which means that the crew was about 10 kilometers lower than the station during the entire orbit uh, around the Earth. The third maneuver is the transfer burn, where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers below the station. And then we rounded everything out with a final co-elliptic burn to once again maintain a constant orbit beneath the station, this time just 2.5 kilometers below it. That's where we picked up to get into the approach initiation phase and the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station. This was also when uh, integrated operations between the Dragon control team located here in Hawthorne and the space station flight controllers in Mission Control Houston uh, started. The teams transitioned to integrated operations about 45 minutes uh, right before approach initiation. Yeah, that's really where we began um, our, our broadcast just over two hours ago. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers worked in tandem with NASA teams in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including the bi-directional communications that Dan mentioned earlier uh, with the station using the C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. Um, this also sets up data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. We we'll also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude or orientation and initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to the station. And a little bit of time ago, the Draco thrusters on Dragon fired for the approach initiation burn when uh, the Dragon was about two and a half kilometers below the station and just about seven kilometers behind it. That swung Dragon up until it was about 400 meters directly below the station. And that maneuver also moved Dragon inside one of the two safety zones that Dan mentioned earlier around the station that required a set of go or no go poles with the different control teams. Yeah, the first um, zone is called the Approach Ellipsoid. It's an, uh, essentially an imaginary um, uh, 
shape measuring four kilometers by um, two kilometers by two kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval around the International Space Station. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside this ellipsoid, uh, referred to the teams as the AE, it's configured to be what is known as um, a 24-hour safe trajectory. And now what this means is that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of all of its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its orbital path would take it inside of the approach ellipsoid. So once Dragon uh, arrived at 400 meters below the station, that was where uh, it was the waypoint zero, which was the first checkpoint during Dragon's approach. Uh, the vehicle could hold at 400 meters, uh, but in this instance, uh, continued on as all systems checked out to approach uh, to waypoint one and uh, through it. Yeah, at this point, the teams uh, passed through waypoint one and continued on to waypoint two. This is where we're currently at, so we're inside that keep out sphere, which is again in, in sort of another imaginary sphere around um, the International Space Station, this time um, uh, 200 meters uh, in radius. And um, at waypoint two, we are currently holding to troubleshoot some video issues um, of a dragon. So we have feed um, of Dragon looking at the docking adapter of the International Space Station. The folks here on ground can also see that video, but uh, there is a disconnect between um, the video feed to the International Space Station. So there are um, a couple of paths that we are continuing to look at, um, uh, and hopefully we can update from the team soon and we can proceed with docking. So while we're waiting for some updates, uh, it's worth discussing, discussing excuse me, uh, the mission patch of the AX-1 mission. So at the heart of the patch is the venerable ISS itself, which is the core of this pioneering private research mission, reflects AX-1's role as a precur precursor for future activity in low Earth orbit and a key step toward the, towards the ISS's commercial successor, Axiom Station. The flags of the four countries adorn the ISS in the middle there in the form of its solar arrays. It represents the multinational crew and reinforces the importance of international collaboration and exploration. And in the background, a cascading plane of blue uh, represents Earth's atmosphere and the journey humanity has traveled to arrive in this new era among the first steps in expanding the human presence in low Earth orbit. The four bright stars you see kind of at the top there, one for each crew member, and an atom at the center of that constellation represents the expedition's scientific and aspirational goals. The very top, the last name of each crew member, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria of the USA and Spain, Pilot Larry Connor of the USA, 
Mission Specialist Mark Pathy of Canada and Mission Specialist Eitan Stiba of Israel ador adorn the top of the design. The bottom highlights the earth overflown while the mission's historic significance is spelled out in the first private crew to the ISS. The golden border around the edge of the patch is inspired by the logo of Rakia, the mission's name in Stiva's home country, which marks the significance of this mission to the people of Israel as it's really their return to flight uh, in honor of their first Israeli astronaut, Elon Ramon. So, you know, Andy, it's certainly a patch filled with a lot of significance and a lot of meaning to the crew. Yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite patches. I especially love the uh, atom symbol in the middle, representing all this cool science that the team is going to do. Um, uh, earlier in the launch webcast, we saw inside the capsule, uh, there are the patches of Demo 2 and Crew 2, which this capsule um, uh, has flown before. And so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this, this patch will also join the other two patches inside the capsule of the Dragon. Absolutely. And if you're hearing some noise in the background of our uh, broadcast, it's worth mentioning that we are in a rocket factory here at uh, SpaceX Hawthorne. So there's still a lot of activity going on even early in the morning um, on Saturday. Yeah, um, things really don't stop around here at SpaceX. So it is uh, just after 5 a.m. on a Saturday, but um, production is starting to pick up again. Um, and that's really just par for the course here for us at SpaceX. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly going to be a busy time for SpaceX uh, with, you know, the launches that are upcoming in the next couple weeks. Um, so talking a little bit more on the uh, members of the AX-1 crew. Um, so our mission commander is Michael Lopez Alegria, who is a decorated um, former NASA astronaut. He calls, uh, he was born in Madrid, Spain, and has also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. He is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz, so he's certainly no stranger to low Earth orbit life. And he has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, which means, you know, extravehicular activity outside of the ISS. And that's accumulated into 67 hours and 40 minutes in the vacuum of space, both of which are NASA records. Um, and in 2021, he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. And uh, sitting next to MLA is the pilot for AX-1, uh, Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur and a nonprofit activist investor. He has won aerobatic flying competitions and summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through, AX through AX-1, he will become the first private pilot to reach the International Space Station. He will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many, many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. And this mission will add a new dimension of several new dimension to several of these studies. And can I just say the deepest depths of space, and then all the way to low Earth orbit? I mean, that is that is wild. I can't even imagine wow. that. Uh, and then our mission specialist one, Eitan Stiva, is now the second Israeli ever to fly to space. Eitan served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal. And today, he is an impact investor and philanthropist. I mentioned earlier what a special mission this is for Eitan and the country of Israel. Uh, he's uh, working under the banner of the Rakia uh, mission, um, which uh, has the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. Uh, during his time on the ISS, he'll facilitate several scientific, exper uh, scientific experiments, educational outreach, as well as artistic activities. And rounding out our crew, Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as the mission specialist, too, on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy, Pathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Don LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy has become Canada's second private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go into space.
So yeah, that was our four crew members. And again, they are um, inside of our Dragon capsule Endeavor, just parked about 20 meters away from the International Space Station. Uh, again, waiting on um, some uh, video troubleshooting um, uh, that the teams here on the ground are currently working through. Um, if you are just joining us, this is uh, a live um, uh, mission uh, for the AX-1 mission, and the crew is uh, was moments away from docking with the International Space Station until we ran into a little bit of a hiccup, but again, we have some uh, primary and backup plans um, that we're working through to hopefully get that video feed to the International Space Station and resume docking operations. And we've, you know, throughout this whole process, we've really heard uh, uh, mission control here at SpaceX, uh, as well as mission control over in Houston, really in lockdown step with each other in integrated operations. It really highlights how much of a collaborative effort um, things like this are. You know, there's a uh, saying in the industry that space is hard, and rightfully so. It's very complex to put a human into space safely. You know, the safety of the crew, um, you know, both in the Dragon capsule and also on the ISS is paramount, um, and it's you know, always the number one focus. So everyone, you, you really want to make sure that each step that you take, you're confirmed that everything is, um, you know, good to go. Yeah, and, and that's why as part of the procedures, we, we have these holds built into the operations and, and to, to verify all of the checks um, in this particular uh, moment, um, the, uh, confirming that that video feed on the International Space Station side uh, is part of the flight operation. So again, the team is going through and doing their due diligence to make sure that uh, everything is set up and safe for uh, the Dragon capsule to um, go ahead and dock with the International Space Station. Absolutely. And in preparation for, you know, troubleshooting moments like this or, you know, just generally uh, life aboard the ISS or, you know, going through launches like this, um, the crew members also have to go through several hours of training. I mean, like, they went through 700 to 1,000 hours of training starting in August of 2021. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of investment of time and resources that they've put into um, preparing for this mission. I mean, they really went above and beyond. Yeah, the International Space Station and the Dragon capsule are uh, have just passed over Peru. Um, again, continuing to circle the Earth, we are in an orbital um, daytime, um, but again, we are still holding at waypoint zero or waypoint um, two, uh, about 20 meters away from um, the docking adapter. So Andy, there's no doubt that the incredible efforts of thousands of folks across NASA over the last two decades have set the stage for you know what is possible in low Earth orbit. The AX-1 mission is a critical step towards opening these possibilities to a host of new participants, you know, governments, diverse researchers, manufacturers, and more people. Um, here on Earth, we're already seeing benefits from research currently conducted on the ISS from water and air purification systems to testing medical devices as well as therapeutics. In addition to tech demos uh, and medical research, access to low Earth orbit allows for a connection to the arts and other outreach opportunities. AX-1 is the first of several proposed missions in the advance of uh, Axiom Station, the world's first commercial space station. A sustainable commercial low Earth orbit economy means that um, expanded access to work in space is um, available. It also uh, frees up NASA and its partners to put their budget towards other exploration programs while granting space agencies around the world more opportunities through commercial efforts. Absolutely, you know, and over its lifetime, the ISS has accomplished an unprecedented feat. It's continuously sustained operations on and off the Earth for more than 20 years, which is not only a true testament to the technology required to physically achieve that, but also to the collaborative and cooperative efforts of thousands of people across the world to ensure that multiple nations, agencies, and entities, both public and private, work together to push humanity forward. 
And you know, as we move forward, private industries like Axiom Space need to need time to learn how to establish and maintain those relationships effectively. So by flying our private astronaut missions like AX1 uh, to the ISS, Axiom is taking essential steps to get that on the job training as we work towards building the fir world's first commercial space station. Axiom Station is an opportunity to continue the story of the ISS. Science and research through cooperation and collaboration on a global scale for the benefit of all. So, you know, AX1 is really uh, the next chapter. Yeah. Uh, for now, um, as we continue to wait for updates um, of the video troubleshooting issue, we are going to check in with Dan uh, over at JSC in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy and Tricia. And so just current status, we're still hanging out at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away. We are coming up on our next troubleshooting steps, though. So uh, the issue we ran into a little bit earlier is getting what's known as the centerline camera. So that's that camera view directly uh, right down the middle of essentially the docking hatch of Dragon pointing at the docking port on station. And one of our flight rules requires that video to be visible on board the space station for the crew monitoring Dragon during its final approach after we proceed in from waypoint two. So the teams have gone through a couple of steps to try and troubleshoot th that to get the video up to the crew. Uh, we have coming up in just a couple of minutes a ground pass. Um, so a couple of things are gonna happen over the next few minutes. First, we're gonna get uh, our KU coverage back with the space station in about a minute, minute and a half. So we'll get views back from the space station. We'll also get that high rate data link uh, where we can essentially also send video signals up to the station crew. At about 7.23 central, so in about two minutes, uh, Dragon's gonna be doing a pass over a SpaceX ground site, which offers another path to get video from Dragon down to the ground. So the teams are going to take that video, ingest it, bring it over here to Mission Control Houston, send it back up to the station crew through another route to hopefully get it into their station support Houston computer on the big for them to for do status. that monitoring. Go ahead on the big loop. Yeah, Roger, wanted to give you a heads up on our plan here. Any moment now, we are expecting KU to come back at this point. We're going to route some camera views um, so that we can see uh, Dragon better from the ground here. At 12.23, so about one minute from now, we are expecting to get a video feed from SpaceX that will just come to MCC Houston over here. That's going to last about five minutes. Our plan is we are going to check the alignment, make sure that Dragon is in good position. As long as those checks work, we are going to press ahead uh, with the docking attempt. How copy so far? Okay, copy about 12.23. You guys will get video to MCC for about five minutes. You guys are going to check the alignment on the ground, and if you're happy, you'll uh, land the press ahead. And that's a good copy, Raja, and we will let you know when we're pressing in. Stand by. Dragon and Capcom's got on to get Dragon easy, the ground. giving the update. Sure you copied all on the big loop. Uh, stand by. Uh, we're zipping up a plan here, uh, and I'll let you know before we command resume. And so again, right now we're standing by for Dragon to make that pass over our SpaceX ground site, the plan. We've now got some additional cameras trained on Dragon, just giving the team's additional alignment insight into the capsule as it still hangs out 20 meters away from the docking port. We're just beginning a pass over station ground sites now, and teams are gonna work to get that video up to the crew. This ground site pass will last for about five minutes and that means the video will likely not be available for the entirety of that final approach. However, Dragon, the SpaceX, way the flight on rules the are loop, written, confirm crew readiness for final approach. SpaceX, Endeavor, copy all, we're ready, visors down. Yeah. 
And again, as long as the teams Dragon have this Apex data now, on the big we're able to confirm the alignment. Dragon is entering approach two. And Dragon's flight computer getting into approach two. Perhaps so we've Denver, gotten that video. We've been able to confirm alignment here on the ground. The NASA flight director and the SpaceX mission director have conferred and confirmed Dragon is in good alignment. We have additional tools available, uh, giving us degrees it's off access to certain time to the telemetry of Dragon at 10, during its approach. Two and one, and we'll be hands off at two meters. Good copy, Dragon. All right, so Dragon is now accelerating in for docking. So again, we were able to get that ground pass video. The teams here in Houston, visiting vehicle officer, other support personnel confirmed Dragon was in good alignment. And that video from the ground site, that's the one you were just seeing on the left. So Dragon's now continuing in towards docking. We've departed waypoint two. We're only 17 and a half meters away. We confirmed good alignment and we've got additional views now trained on Dragon giving additional situational awareness. And we're continuing to get those updates from the navigational equipment on board Dragon. The LIDAR is giving real-time range rate. Uh, we're getting real-time degrees, and that's also being fed to the crew in real time. They don't have that video, but they do have all that additional data that's able to give them uh, enough data to make decisions for board if they need to. So we have proceeded. We are go for docking. Dragon's flying in. It's moving at less than a tenth of a meter per second. We're just about 15 meters away now from the docking port on the space facing side of node two. Should be just under three minutes away from docking. And you can see the soft capture ring on the docking mechanisms extended. It's got three of those slightly triangular looking shapes and those are the pedals that are going to be used to guide it in to the passive docking me mechanism on the station side. After that makes the initial attachment, that docking ring is going to retract, bring it in, and then it's going to be able to make a hard mate, engaging 12 hooks to give a, the, the hard mate, the hard dock um, to the space station. SpaceX copies, 10 meters. So 10 meters again, once we get to about six meters, you're gonna hear the crew call out chop. That's the crew hands off point. That's just giving direction to the crew on board Dragon not to make any manual control decisions or movements as everything gets handled by the flight computer from that point in. Eight meters away. Continuing to get confirmation that Dragon is in the correct attitude in the approach corridor, not tracking any issues, just past seven meters from the docking port. Six meters in closing. The international five docking meters. adapter number three in view Basics on the lower copies, right there. Five meters. Under five meters to go. Still seeing good alignment. under three meters. Soft docking ring on two Dragon on top off. there. International docking adapter Basics on the right. copies, two meters. Two meters, we heard chop call, the crew hands off point. One meter. One meter to go. Dragon, SpaceX, on the big loop, contact soft and soft capture complete. 
Attenuation in progress. Endeavor, copy all, good. All right, so with that contact and capture coming at 7.29 a.m. Central Time, 5.29 a.m. Eastern, that's 12.29 UTC, while the station and Dragon flew 258 statute miles over the Central Atlantic Ocean. So with that initial contact made, the soft capture ring is now going to begin to retract. After Dragon, that is SpaceX completed, on the big we'll be able to soft start capture ring hooks. retraction in progress. Big soft capture ring in progress. So we're now going to see Dragon inch a little bit closer to that docking adapter until it essentially performs a sealed connection. And then we'll be able to engage 12 hooks that uh, form the hard capture function onboard Dragon. Six of those are actually engaged during the launch and on the way into orbit, and they hold the nose cone, which you can see opened off to the right there. They hold that in place, uh, and then they're opened up once we're on orbit to deploy the nose cone. Uh, but 12 of those are now going to engage after the soft capture ring has retracted. Once those 12 are engaged, we'll have a hard mate. Then we can start co to connect two umbilicals that are going to uh, provide hard line data and power to Dragon through station systems. And then we'll be able to get the docking complete call. And then it's on to uh, some of the post-docking operations. So for the crew inside Dragon, they'll be getting out of their suits, uh, doing some basic cabin configuration as they get ready to open the hatch on their side. Uh, that'll be the last hatch to open. Uh, meanwhile, on the station side, uh, Tom Marshburn and the Expedition 67 crew will start outfitting what's called the A-pass hatch. That's the hatch on the station side. It's got a small valve that Marshburn's going to open up to begin to flow atmosphere to the space between the Dragon and the station hatches. Right now, it's still exposed to vacuum, but as soon as we're able to pull Dragon in and engage those hooks, uh, that will become a sealed uh, sealed space and so we'll be able to pressurize it essentially just flowing atmosphere from the station into that previously vacuum space between the two hatches we'll stop a couple of times on the way up and the pressure uh, just to do leak checks and let thermals equalize to make sure that we're actually measuring pressure and how much atmosphere is in there and not just thermal fluctuations um, and so once we get that up to pretty much the same ambient pressure as the space station will open the A-pass hatch first and then it'll be over to the Dragon crew to open the hatch into Crew Dragon Endeavor. So still waiting for that soft capture ring to retract. Um, this might be a bit of deja vu for Dragon Commander Mike L.A. as this is actually the second time in his spaceflight career that he's docked to the space station on a spacecraft named Endeavor. Uh, he flew on Shuttle Endeavour back on STS-113, flying to the station in November of 2002 to deliver the Expedition 6 crew. So thank you to our resident space flight encyclopedia for that tidbit. So for now, the soft capture ring's still retracting, and once that's completed, uh, we'll be able to begin connecting those hooks and those are going to hold it in place we'll get those umbilicals and then we'll be able to start stepping into hatch operations dragon spacex on the big loop ring retraction complete docking sequence is holding for mcs reconfiguration spacex endeavor copy all And that soft capture ring has retracted. Uh, as you heard, we're going to now stand by for a moment for MCS reconfigure. That's the motion control system on board station. For the docking ops, we were we had handed over to the thrusters on the Russian segment for propulsive attitude control. Uh, now that the soft capture is completed, we're going to hand back over 
uh, to the gyroscopes, the large gyroscopes on the U.S. segment that are just run electronically to provide non-propulsive attitude control to the station. And then once that handover is complete, we'll start engaging those 12 hooks, holding Dragon in place, and then getting closer to that docking complete call. But um, if you're just joining the docking, that initial contact and capture did take place uh, just about five minutes ago at 7.29 a.m. Central, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, 12.29 GMT, as uh, both the station and Dragon were flying 258 statute miles over the Atlantic, connecting the spacecraft to the station, carrying the first all-private astronaut mission to station the orbit Houston, lab. MCS is configured, proceeding with hook driving. And we now have the motion control system on the station reconfigured back in uh, attitude control being done by the U.S. gyroscopes, and they're now going to start engaging those 12 hooks uh, on the Dragon capsule. All right, we've got confirmation that the hooks have started to drive. And so there's 12 total. We're going to do them in two groups of six. Um, so the, the first set of six driving now. Um, in this split screen view, you've got the newly arrived Dragon Endeavor on the left. On the right there is NASA astronaut and current Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn. Uh, he's on the timeline to take the lead in the vestibule pressurization operation, so he's going to be uh, moving into uh, the pressurized mating adapter in the space-facing side of node 2 and working on the station side hatch, opening up a valve to uh, start to flow atmosphere from station into that uh, soon-to-be sealed pressurized area between the two hatches. And again, we expect hatch opening to take place roughly two hours uh, should be a little bit less than two hours following a docking. Um, so with that docking happening uh, right around 7.30 Central, um, it'll probably be uh, sometime uh, in the 9 o'clock hour uh, before we get the hatches open. For the crew on board, they're going to remain in their seats throughout this as we continue to drive the hooks. And then once those hooks are driven and docking is complete, we will be able to have them get out of the suits. Uh, that'll be one of the first items for them. Uh, they'll also begin to just reconfigure the cabin. And we just got confirmation six of those hooks are engaged, so the first set is good. And then the second set is now driving. And again, first set of hooks are in place. Second set of six hooks are now driving. And once we get those in place and get uh, the umbilicals deployed, we'll have docking complete. And then the crew will be able to get out of their suits on board of Dragon. Uh, they'll start to reconfigure the cabin. One of the first things that they'll do uh, once we get hatches open is to remove what's called a lyo canister. It's lithium hydroxide. That's the system used on board of Dragon to scrub CO2 from the air. They just remove it and put a seal over it as um, they've got a couple of essentially cartridges that get used while Dragon's in free flight. Um, and as they're going to be integrating Dragon's atmosphere with the rest of station, uh, they'll take that out 
and then they'll be able to rely on uh, the station atmospheric revitalization systems, uh, scrubbing CO2, providing oxygen uh, for the duration of their docked visit. Um, once they get on board, and I'll we'll address this a few times, we usually get asked, where's everybody gonna sleep? As we now have 11 people uh, on board the space station. Uh, for the AX-1 crew, they're gonna be split up in a couple of different areas. One will sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one will set up a, a temporary sleep location in the Quest airlock. And then we'll have two spots inside of the European Columbus module. Um, one in the newly fabricated CASA, the, it's essentially a new uh, crew quarters set up there, uh, the roughly closet sized uh, private booths SpaceX that we have on, on board the station capture with four uh, over in node two. SpaceX Endeavor hard capture complete. And there's the call, hard capture is complete. So all 12 hooks engaged and in place. Next up are some umbilicals, but Dragon now firmly attached to the space station. We see the visors come up on the crew inside, and we can start now stepping into some of the operations to get those hatches open and get these AX-1 astronauts on board the station. So with that, I'm gonna send it over to the team in Hawthorne. Andy, Trisha, congratulations on docking the first private astronaut mission to station. Uh, why don't you take us a little bit for the rest of the way? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, right back at you. Um, uh, that was amazing. And so we did dock uh, about an hour later than scheduled, but I always like to think of it as a silver lining. Uh, we were to, able to get an orbital daytime during the dock, so absolutely gorgeous views of Dragon's approach and contact with the International Space Station. And uh, as Dan had mentioned, and, and we heard over the nets, uh, hard capture is complete. We are waiting for umbilicals to be plugged in and installed, um, but Dragon is now firmly secured to the International Space Station, so um, docking procedures can uh, continue, um, and eventually the crew will make their way out of Dragon and onto the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, it's just incredibly exciting to watch that. I mean, watching the whole process of Dragon approaching uh, the <clears throat> docking adapter and then, you know, completing that dock was just, I mean, personally for me, I was very, very excited. So I can only imagine what the crew is feeling like right now. This is, you know, like setting off the rest of the uh, eight days that they're going to have on orbit. So just an incredibly exciting time and very special for everyone involved. Yeah, and, and absolutely an incredible effort from the teams to um, troubleshoot that issue and get things going. Um, that is really what uh, the joint operations and, and, uh, and space is about. Uh, you had mentioned it earlier, space is not easy, um, but you know it takes a lot of very dedicated, uh, talented, smart, uh, 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 hardworking folks uh, to make sure these things are done safely. So, um, yeah, with uh, the crew uh, now one step closer to um, uh, getting on board the International Space Station and starting all of the cool science that, uh, you know, I'm sure they're excited to do. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, docking sequence complete. I hope you enjoyed the extra half orbit in Dragon or at least found it memorable. Crew Dragon Endeavor and MLA, welcome back. Aton Larry Mark, welcome to the International Space Station. SpaceX Endeavor, we copy all. We're happy to be here, even though we're a bit uh, late and looking forward to the uh, next chapter. Thanks for all the great work. On behalf of SpaceX, it's been a pleasure working with you. At this time, ground will be enabling power and comm connections. You are go to DOF suits for procedure 4.012. We'll bring the cameras external shortly. Thanks, Jake. We're moving to 4.012. An endeavor from MCCH. Welcome to the International Space Station. We are looking forward to uh, this historic mission. MCCH, 
WCH Endeavor. Thanks for all the great work. We're looking forward to uh, moving uh, into the ISS with the uh, other crews. We're looking forward to it, Endeavor. Welcome aboard. So uh, some final exchanges as uh, the crew on board Capsule Endeavor begin to doff or take off their spacesuits. Uh, in the past, they've actually just left. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required. Cameras are external. In the past, uh, I think uh, what we've seen is the, the suits are just kind of left in the seats, strapped in, and, and they're stored in the Dragon. Um, but it is uh, quite a, a uh, funny scene to see the astronauts kind of floating around, gathering their belongings, and there's like these four mannequins <laughs> sitting in the seats. Uh, but they're getting ready. Um, there, um, uh, there are a couple more operations that need to happen before we can open both of the hatches. So um, as Dan was mentioning, the A-pass hatch on the International Space Station side um, will open first. Um, prior to that, we're going to fill the vestibule, which is the space between the two hatches. We're going to fill that with um, air and pressure uh, to make sure that um, it is equalized on both sides. Then we'll open the A-pass hatch. Then the Dragon hatch will open, and then uh, the crews can meet. Station Houston for Tom on the big loop. Go ahead, Houston, on the big loop. Yes, sir. Better late than never, but we can now give you a go to get into uh, ingress part one. And specifically, you have a go through 1.1 1 and 2.2. Copy, 1.1 one one and 2.1, one. I have a go for the part one of the hatch opening. Copy that. Also, you have a go in 2.2 two two when you get there. Copy, and a go in 2.2. So again, beginning the initial steps for hatch open uh, on both sides. Uh, so uh, with that, you know, it's been outside of the, the small hiccup with video, smooth ride up um, uh, to the International Space Station. Absolutely. The crew has certainly been on a long journey starting bright and early yesterday, April 8th, for, uh, you know, when they arrived to uh, launch pad 39A, leading all the way up to launch at 8.17 a.m. Eastern and 11.17 a.m. Pacific on April 8th. And, now, you know, just having completed uh, the docking sequence and now they're beginning hatch operations it's just very exciting to see um the whole journey that they've been through yeah the crew has been uh, in space and in dragon for almost a day actually um we're we're coming up on 23 or 24 hours in inside the capsule um on board they were able to eat a couple of meals um they had a sleep and rest period they we we did an onboard uh, live event earlier uh, this morning um, so I'm sure the crew is super excited to, uh, you know, take off those spacesuits and uh, get uh, head their way uh, into the International Space Station. And this here is a great view of Dragon. It is docked at the uh, Zenith port. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon ground. Cabin check. Sorry, cabin mic check. Dragon, SpaceX on the cabin mic. We have you five by five. Glad to hear you loud and clear again. Lots of exciting things happening. Uh, with that, yeah, let's... Yeah, same here. Do you want me to do another comp big loop? At this point, I'm expecting it's a suit issue. Uh, that's not gospel, but um, I, we're, I think we're good. Uh, oh, I understand. Yeah, com mic, com check on the big loop would be good. Cabin mic on the big loop. It's such 
Endeavour on the big loop, Kevin Mike check. Endeavour SpaceX on the big loop, Kevin Mike check five by five. Copy all, thanks, Jake. Uh, so we are going through some checks. This is a view of Dragon docked at the Zenith or space-facing uh, space port. Uh, so uh, the uh, hatch is actually pointing down towards Earth, um, and the crew is inside, again, doffing their spacesuits or taking off their spacesuits, getting ready to enter the uh, International Space Station here shortly. Uh, for now, we're going to send it back over to Dan at, jo at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy. Yeah, we are now docked and ready to get into hatch ops. So uh, pretty soon we're gonna start flowing air through a small valve uh, in the station's A-pass hatch. It's just the hatch on the station side uh, into what's known as the vestibule. That's just that small space that before docking is just exposed to vacuum. Uh, but now with Dragon firmly attached, we've got a tight seal uh, and we're gonna start uh, pressurizing that section. So we're going to do it uh, in a couple of steps. Um, Station Commander Tom Marshburn is going to be primed for this. Um, and first thing uh, is he's right now in Node 2 uh, in the Harmony module, and here's a live view. Uh, first, he's working to open up um, what's known as the uh, PMA hatch, so the hatch into the pressurized mating adapter. This is closed during the docking operations. And with that, Tom Marshburn has that PMA hatch open. So you can see now inside the pressurized mating adapter, uh, we do use it for storage um, as space is limited on board the station. So number of items stored, but you can see the cover uh, to the A-pass hatch now uh, in view. So Marshburn is going to go there. He's going to open a small valve. It's going to start flowing uh, atmosphere from the station into the vestibule. We're going to slowly pressurize that. Uh, we're going to use sensors on the Dragon hatch to measure temperature and uh, pressure inside of the vestibule as that happens. So station on the big loop, no two overhead hatches. And so right open. now he's going to... Copy. Hatch open. Thanks, Tom. And so Marshburn just radioing down the, the overhead hatch to the hatch into the, the pressurized mating adapter is open. He's grabbed a tablet with his procedures on, and he's going to now start stepping through uh, the vestibule pressurization. So he's going to open a small equalization valve, um, and that's going to start flowing air uh, from station into that vestibule. Um, we're going to give it some time uh, for those hatch seals inside to relax. Um, is we're going to be introducing a pretty substantial thermal change for them. Um, so again, as we're as we're measuring pressure inside, we want to ensure that that's not just the air heating up, but we're getting a, an accurate reading of how much atmosphere is now in that vestibule. And we're going to continue this pressurization until you essentially equalize the pressure between uh, the vestibule and the station and Dragon. They're all going to be at a very similar pressure. We can wait for pressures to equalize um, so we can uh, just kind of pause and wait uh, but at this point the vestibule pressurization has started it sounds like uh, we're getting that valve open um, and so we're going to start stepping through so this all told um, will take about 10 minutes to start the, the pressurization uh, and then after that we're going to do a leak check that can go anywhere from 15 minutes up. Oh, quick view of Raja Chari, who was doing our primary dragon monitoring there. Uh, but after we get the vestibule pressurized, we'll, we'll go into a leak check uh, where they just, again, they wait for thermal conditions to stabilize. They're able to uh, do a leak check and then ensure that the vestibule is pressure tight.
Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required. ISS crew are stepping into vestibule pressurization imminently. You are free to follow along with telemetry in 4.400 section 4 if you'd like. Houston station on the big loop. APAS equalization valve is open for 75 seconds. Now closed at the GMT 1255. Twelve five five copy. We will take care of the leak check from the ground. Give you a heads up here in just a little bit. Copy. And so as we just heard the Dragon crew get told, the vestibule pressurization is beginning. So again, that's done on the station side. Again, this is Mission Control Houston, so Dragon currently docked to the International Space Station. They linked up with the space-facing port on No-2, the Harmony module, uh, just about 30 minutes ago, docking at 7.29 a.m. Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, while the station and Dragon were flying just 258 statute miles over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we did hang out at Waypoint 2, just about 20 minutes away. Uh, while we were troubleshooting, uh, while we were troubleshooting uh, a video issue, getting it over to the the station crew for monitoring, but we were able to effect a workaround. Teams on the ground confirming that Dragon was in uh, the proper alignment, proper attitude, and then the capsule was able to get the go for final approach, and then link up. So, with the docking complete, Dragon firmly attached, we're into hatch ops. So. Tom Marshburn has started the pressurization of the vestibule, that space between the two hatches, 
And we're going to continue that and then execute a leak check, which can take anywhere from 15 minutes up to an hour, just depending on uh, what kind of readings we start getting back. We're going to be using sensors on the Dragon Hatch for tracking pressure, temperature, everything uh, inside that vestibule. Meanwhile, the crew on board Dragon is able to now get out of their suits that they were wearing for that dynamic phase of rendezvous and docking. And then once uh, they're out of there, they can monitor the hatch ops from their side. And then once everything is done uh, with the station crew getting the vestibule pressurized, they'll open up the station side hatch first, and then it'll be over to the AX-1 crew to open the hatch on Dragon. And then after we get the hatches open, the Expedition 67 crew will be able to welcome them on board. And we will have a welcome ceremony um, sometime after hatch open. Uh, could take as long as 30 minutes as there are a couple of steps they have to uh, take just after we get the hatches open just to get Dragon configured for docked operations, including taking some steps just to start integrating Dragon's cabin atmosphere with that on board the space station. Uh, and then we'll get the entire Expedition 67 crew, all seven of them, uh, along with the recently arrived AX-1 astronauts all together and have a special ceremony to welcome the first private astronaut mission to the space station. We docked about 45 minutes behind schedule uh, per the original timeline, so we are expecting uh, pretty much everything else to shift with that. Um, but we'll continue to give you updates as we get through hatch operations and get ready to bring the crew on board. Station Endeavour, Houston, on the big loop for Timeline Sync. Endeavour's ready to copy. Yes, Station, and Endeavour wanted to give everyone a heads up the way uh, the rest of the day is going to look here with uh, docking occurring 45 minutes late. The intention here is the PAO event and the subsequent safety briefing will slide to the right by 45 minutes, um, which will carry over to the rest of the day. However, we'll let you guys flex and manage. Um, if you're able to make up some time, we are good with that. Otherwise, uh, we'll hang in with you um, as the timeline would be extended a little bit. I'll copy. Copies off. 
Copy, and thanks for the flexibility. Copy that, LA. We talked to Station on uh, Space to Ground 3 earlier, so they are aware, so we're good and in sync. But thanks for the heads up. Okay, you got it. LA, we've got you loud and clear, and we're following along on Space to Ground 2. Big loop. Okay, Kayla, thanks. And we just heard an update called up to the crew from the Capcom Scott's Gatey here in Houston. Uh, as mentioned, docking did take place about 45 minutes after the initially intended time, uh, as we did spend extra time at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away from station, to troubleshoot a video issue, just getting video um, up to the station crew. Uh, we were able to come up with a workaround, teams on the ground, able to confirm Dragon attitude positioning uh, all within normal bounds. And they did that final approach and that docking happening at 7.29 a.m. Uh, Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, that's 12.29 GMT. And that happened while both the station uh, and Dragon were flying just over the central part of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, since then, we're already now into hatch operations. Um, so the vestibule pressurization is underway. Uh, a small uh, relief valve has been opened uh, on the station side to flow atmosphere into that space between the Dragon and station hatches. Uh, we're using sensors on the Dragon hatch to measure uh, that pressurization. Uh, and then we're going to, after it gets up to about ambient pressure with the rest of the station, we're going to pause uh, and we're going to let thermal stabilize and then conduct a leak check just to make sure that we've got a tight seal between the Dragon and the station uh, before we start opening up the hatches. We're going to open the hatch on the station side first. It's called the A-pass hatch. Um, so the station crew will get that open, and then once we, again, confirm pressures are roughly equalized between station Dragon, and Dragon, station, uh, the Dragon on crew the will open up Power their hatch. to Dragon established. They just called up that a, that the power connection to Dragon has been established. So two umbilicals uh, have now been extended and connected between the Dragon spacecraft and the space station. That allows them to have a hard line integration into station power and data. Uh, now Dragon using the station systems uh, to power. Uh, its own uh, its own hardware inside, um, not relying on those solar arrays or any batteries at this point, able to draw power from the station. Uh, Dragon is largely left in a power down mode um, after the crew gets uh, on board. A lot of its systems are put into kind of a quiescent mode while docked, uh, with the SpaceX teams routinely bringing them up um, during the docked mission just to do checkouts. Uh, but for now, they are... Um, hooked in to station power, to station data, um, and then once we get the hatches open, they'll uh, take some steps to integrate the cabin atmosphere and Dragon with that on board the space station, able to rely on the regenerative uh, capabilities of the space station, and then preserve, preserving uh, the consumables on board Dragon, both the, the breathable oxygen and nitrogen, and also the carbon dioxide scrubbing. Um, so those will get essentially taken out of their configs and will get brought back up online when it's time for Dragon to depart. And so at this point, the vestibule has been pressurized. 
And we're now going to start stepping through those leak checks. Those can take uh, as, soon as, as short as about 15 minutes up to an hour. Just depends on how long it takes uh, to reach a thermal equilibrium and also just uh, to make sure that we have steady pressure readings. Again, using sensors on the Dragon hatch to actually perform this leak check. Then after we confirm a good leak check, we'll be able to get the go up to the station crew to open up the hatch on their side. Uh, and then it'll be over to the SpaceX team. We, there's usually about 30 minutes um, between those two hatches being opened, uh, the A-Pass coming first, uh, followed shortly after uh, by the Dragon hatch. But things look quiet right now. The crew actually getting some time, uh, the crew on board station, uh, getting some time right now for their midday meal uh, before they get ready to get the hatch open and welcome the AX-1 astronauts on board. Uh, right after we get everyone on, we'll have the entire Expedition 67 crew join with the AX-1 uh, astronauts and do a formal welcome ceremony, welcoming uh, the first fully private astronaut mission on board the space station. Following that, there's uh, still a pretty busy day for the rest of the afternoon. Um, the station commander, Tom Marshburn, will take the entire station crew, um, so all of our new astronauts as well as the Expedition 67 ones, and doing a safety briefing. This is routine for any crew members arriving at the space station, whether they're professional astronauts or uh, on these new private astronaut missions. Um, Marshburn, as the commander, has overall safety authority for the crew during the expedition on board, and he'll just go through essentially an orientation session, um, showing where all of the critical safety equipment is located, going over paths toward to safe haven, back to vehicles, hatch closings, uh, of that nature, um, just giving a safety briefing. Lasts typically about an hour um, before the crew will then go through the rest of their day. Um, Station Commander Marshburn is gonna be uh, taking about an hour and a half to do what's known as crew handover with all the newly arrived astronauts, uh, essentially just giving them a tour of the facilities on board, uh, showing them where they're going to be setting up for the duration, uh, just starting to get them acquainted uh, with their home for uh, more than the next week uh, while they're on board. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but we do usually get asked pretty frequently, where's everyone going to sleep? as we do not have 11 crew quarters on board, but we have 11 crew members on the space station now. Um, so for our recently arrived AX-1 crew, uh, one of them is gonna sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one of them is going to be over in the Quest airlock um, where we uh, stage spacewalks out of. Uh, we're not doing any spacewalks during this mission or anytime soon, no planned spacewalks. Um, so one crew member will set up in there, and then two will be in the Columbus module, one in uh, the, the newly installed CASA, the crew quarters um, that's over in Columbus, and then another one just setting up what we typically refer to as a campout configuration, um, also in Columbus. So they'll be spread out throughout the station um, for their time on board. So again, right now, uh, the vestibule has been pressurized. We're going through the leak checks. Uh, that view on the right, uh, a view up towards the docking port. Um, you're looking at the A-pass or the station hatch side. And the Houston uh, station pretty soon for private after we get through. And again, pretty soon after we get through uh, this leak check, the crew on board will get the go to begin opening that hatch. We'll get the station side open first, followed shortly thereafter uh, by the hatch on board Dragon. And then we'll be able to get the AX-1 crew inside and go through a welcome ceremony to welcome these uh, first private astronaut mission crew members on board the station. We'll have a couple of participants here on the ground able to talk to the crew and then their uh, commander Mike LA will go through a short ceremony and then it'll be off and running for the AX-1 mission. They've already got uh, a number of activities both just kind of getting themselves set up uh, but already stepping into some of their science their outreach activities immediately uh, on this day today. Uh, the entire crew so everybody on board 
uh, is scheduled to go to sleep at uh, a little bit later than the normal time, uh, about 4.30 central here in Houston. Uh, we do keep all of the crew on essentially the same sleep schedule whenever possible, um, just so you don't have obviously people moving around and turning lights on while you're trying to sleep in low Earth orbit. Um, they typically follow a schedule uh, for us here in the U.S. where they're waking up uh, in the middle of the night for us. Uh, in fact, their wake up time tomorrow will be about 1 a.m. here in Houston. And then they immediately get into a lot of their operations. Since tomorrow is Sunday, um, for most of the Expedition 67 crew, uh, it's going to be a relatively light day. As the weekends are typically an off day for them. They'll have some cleaning tasks, which get scheduled on the weekend. Um, each of the crew members spending about two hours exercising, even on their off days. And that's just to help uh, combat the negative effects on the human body of that extended period of time in microgravity, uh, but largely for the Expedition 67 crew, a day off. But for the AX-1, they have a pack schedule tomorrow. Um, one additional activity that will involve the entire crew, so all 11 uh, individuals on board the station, will be just another um, emergency role and response review. So again, just going over um, what each of the crew members has to do in the event of a contingency. We plan for these, we train for these. Everybody that flies to the space station has to go through that training on the ground. And then they're just getting a refresher now that they're up on board around the real hardware, around the real settings uh, that they would have to make that response. So for right now, we're just continuing to follow. Again, they're doing uh, leak checks right now in the vestibule. That's that space between the two hatches, uh, the hatch on station and the hatch on Dragon. We've pressurized it, uh, opening up the valve and uh, introducing atmosphere from the station into that small space. And so we'll hold here for a while, wait for uh, essentially the leak rate to, to bottom out, make sure we have a tight seal uh, before we can get ready to open up the hatch on the station side first, followed soon after by the hatch on Dragon. And this is Mission Control Houston. So we are still waiting for uh, vestibule leak checks to be completed. Again, it has been pressurized, that small space between the space station and the Dragon. And those leak checks taking anywhere from 15 minutes all the way up to an hour. Um, as was radioed up to the crew, we were about 45 minutes late with docking uh, after doing that video troubleshooting, hanging out at waypoint two. 
Uh, we were originally Station planning Endeavor on getting on the, the hatch loop. open. FYI, we're going to reconfigure for hardline comm. It will take down comm to drag in for about two minutes, and we'll give you a call when it comes back. And the Dragon crew getting a heads up. So as mentioned, Dragon now has hardline connections for both power and data to the space station. So they're now going to configure communications to follow through those paths using station systems to come back down to the ground. Uh, Dragon uses the same, while in free flight, the same tracking and data relay satellites as the station. Uh, but just so we're not... Uh, sending an additional wireless signal or at, at a minimum just taking advantage of the station systems uh, they're going to be switching over to the hardline communications so while that happens we're still continuing with the vestibule leak checks uh, they have to take some time to to make sure that uh, the temperature swings steady out inside the vestibule just to ensure that the pressure that we're reading uh, is not caused by any thermal variance, just uh, based off of the actual amount of atmosphere that we float in. And so while we wait for that to continue, uh, the crew on board the station has got some time to go through their midday meal. And meanwhile, the astronauts on board Dragon have given uh, have been given the go to get out of their spacesuits. They, they wore those throughout all of the approach and docking procedures. And they're going to wear those for all of the different dynamic phases of the flight. So they were in them for launch. They were in them for docking. They're going to be in them for undocking. And then eventually when they come home on the entry, descent, and landing. But as mentioned, we ended up docking about 45 minutes later than originally intended. Um, so pretty much our entire schedule now shifting about 45 minutes later. We'd originally intended to get the hatches open uh, at the bottom of the hour this hour at about 8.30 central. Uh, now looking at getting those hatches open at about 9.15 or so, uh, just depending on how quickly we're able to get through these leak checks and then start to get the hatches open. First the one on station side and then the one over on Dragon. Um, and so we'll be looking at about the 9 o'clock hour uh, for the hatches to get open and after which the AX-1 Astronauts will make their way on board and we'll do a formal welcome ceremony with them and the entirety of the Expedition 67 crew. So while we wait for the vestibule leak checks to be completed, taking us one step closer to hatch open, Send it back over to Andy and Tricia to tell us a little bit more about this mission, which now attached to the space station. Can't wait to see them on board. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground for cabin configuration update. Go ahead, Jake. Hey, Mike. The ISS crew is inching towards a hatch open state. Wanted to check in that the Dragon crew is working towards that as well. We're working toward it, but we aren't going to be dressed for dinner. Copy all, Mike. That was perfectly vague, and I will uh, leave it to you to configure the cabin. While we're talking about that, in 4.400, Section 3, let me know when you're ready. Hey, I am ready for inventory. Go ahead. We haven't touched uh, any food since we last spoke. Um, as far as water, we've taken that same bag uh, out of Location 9 and are continuing to drink bottles from it. Stand by one. have been consumed. Uh, just a question on that. Uh, what? How do you want to account for that? Uh, do you want us to just finish all the bottles that we open and then put it back uh, in, put them back in the bag? 
Hey, Mike, yeah, I think that's going to be the cleanest way to do it. Um, if you could finish any of the half-consumed bottles. Um, and to be clear, these were coming from bag number what? Cup y'all, six consumed from bag 204. That's affirmed. And then as far as the um, trash that is described in 3.2, we are just going to hand over the uh, duffel from location 21 to the ISS crew, and that will have all of our waste in it, both uh, trash and uh, the the um, comfort garments that we're wearing now. Okay, copy all, Mike. That sounds right. I'll get back to you if uh, we discover that to not be the correct way forward, uh, but good plan. Okay, thank you. Station Houston on the big loop for Tom. on the big loop for Tom. Yeah, Tom, good news. We have passed the leak check, so at this point we can give you a go for your ingress part two activities. Uh, you have a go in step three, decimal one. Okay, go in step three, decimal one of the opening part two. Thank you. Good copy. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, too. So to summarize, we heard.